right, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, so just some meeting logistics uh, and some instructions uh, uh, for participants. So, um, and we don't have any remote participants tonight. Uh, so if you are joining us remotely, if you would change your uh, Zoom name to your first and last name so I can refer to you uh, properly. Uh, if when you speak, if you would start by uh, saying your name and where you live, that'd be great. Um, we are, are asking folks to keep their comments to uh, two minutes or less, and Don over here is going to help us with time there. Um, if uh, you're going to uh, speak on a topic, just make sure that it is uh, relevant to the agenda item that we are discussing. Um, and if you uh, wish to speak, just make sure that uh, I've acknowledged you um, uh, first. And because uh, we don't really get into like back and forth uh, situations here. So if you uh, if you have multiple questions, if you could ask them all together, that would be helpful. Uh, and um, I think that is it. Uh, all right. So, yes, just uh, for those in the room those watching, we are having a little bit of technical difficulty tonight. So there is the screen that normally is seen in our room is not functioning. So people in the room can't see faces like they normally can. And so if there's any presentations that won't be up on the big screen, the council members can all see them on their computers. But just FYI, there is, uh, so we're trying to figure that out, but something happened with our projector today and um, it's not fixed, okay. so. All right. uh, great, so uh, we're going to look at uh, the agenda. So um, information about changing the agenda. Um, I My understanding is that we are not uh, going to be doing the appointments to the homelessness task force tonight, right? So that is not on the agenda. Um, we'll be putting that out for another meeting. Uh, any other changes folks would like to see? Okay. Um, oh, okay. I just may wish to, I, I see that the CVHHH folks are here. I had told them they'd be near the beginning of the agenda. They are they're right after the appointments, but if you wanted to move them ahead of the appointments, um, you could do that. Well, that's, um, that's a good question. I think um, I'm change. hoping that the appointments go relatively quickly, okay. so hopefully we can. Oh, and one other change, yes. there is no appointment to the housing committee either. Okay. That should not have been on there. We, there are no vacant seats on the housing committee. Okay, great, super, thank you. All right, so we are on to general business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, so if uh, folks have something they'd like to say that is not pertinent to something on the agenda, now is the time. And we'll start with folks in person. So if, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Dexter Lefevre, and I'm running for state senate. And I'm here tonight just to introduce myself to the city council. I, some of you already know me, and some of you aren't city council sitting around the table. So uh, introduce myself to you as well. I guess we know each other. Huh? Uh, so uh, I live in Middlesex. I've been in Middlesex 05602 since 1986. Uh, I've raised uh, four kids uh, at my farm up there, and they've been through uh, U32. Professionally, I'm a civil engineer. I deal in wet infrastructure, so water, wastewater, and stormwater uh, engineering for mostly for municipalities, but I've done some private work as well over the years. Um, I don't know much more to tell you about me. You know, I've got a couple of side gigs. I, I'm an uh, adjunct professor at Norwich. I teach uh, intro to engineering lab, and uh, I'm also a professional skier and snowboarder, although I think my retirement is due uh, now. Um, so anyway, I, I really, that's about all I wanted to do to introduce myself, but I'd welcome any questions or interaction uh, with the board, with the council. I did want to mention I've been, I'm trying to go to all the city councils. I've been 100% of the city councils in the district, thanks to tonight's success and about 60% of the uh, select boards. So it's been fun. All right. Thank you very much. Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, I want to start with, you know, a little bit of history, just like shame on you for tolerating somebody being arrested for exercising their First Amendment rights. 
and y'all think it's just par for the course, uh, that's that's on you, and you need to deal with it each individually and collectively. Um, you got a corrupt police department. You you need oversight. You need citizen oversight, not advisory. When you have lying officers, uh, brutal lying officers who threw me into the wall right there and then lied about the handcuffs, and y'all are going to appoint fact finders for you know the arts committee gate, and you're not going to appoint fact finders to address issues like the police chief violently assaulting somebody in the hallway for exercising their First Amendment rights on direction of the mayor. So public records requests pending. Uh, a request was made for all records relating to complaints about the veracity or professionalism of city employees. And I'm told that's too big of an email search to do. That means that your manager or mismanager is not keeping those things in a file for the employees. But when people are, you know, when officials, when your our public employees are called out for lying, especially when they're lying about a violent assault on somebody, and y'all don't put it in a file or keep track of it, but the appeal to the head of the agency was filed, a reminder filed weeks later, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I never got the five-day response. And then another 10 days has passed. So this city needs an attorney that will hold Bill Frazier accountable. Attorneys are bound by ethical codes, as you've learned from you know, Trump's fiasco. Um, in effect, we've got a city manager who walks up to and across the line regularly, which wouldn't be allowed if he had to consult with a city manager. Public records requests that end up in litigation that end up costing the city money should come out of the city manager's pocket, not out of the taxpayer's pocket. So garbage in the river, the pile is still down there, and we've got an inch of rain coming tomorrow, so it could well wash downstream. You know, this is the shopping carts, the picnic tables that were destroyed by the folk confluence park users. I mean, what is it about this hypocrisy of environmental stewardship that you don't get or that you don't act on, that you refuse to act on? But I went and inspected even today. I inspected last Friday when it was supposed to be cleaned up and the pri Friday before that when it was supposed to be cleaned up. So you don't have... I think you need to change your two minute limit. I noticed you went from saying about two minutes or, you know, to hard two minutes and it's unconstitutional. Thank you. Anyone else who's with us in person? Yes. Greetings, uh, Connor graciously offered me an opportunity to give a very brief update. So I'm here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Dan Toll. I am the president and founder of Parker Advisors. We are hired by the uh, city and the homelessness task force to conduct a needs assessment of homelessness here in Montpelier and Washington County. Um, the overarching obje objective, um, just to level set for everybody, is to provide concrete and actionable uh, solutions for the homelessness, homelessness issue here in uh, Montpelier and Washington County that both the community and the city and the unhoused can feel good about. That's sort of the bottom line. Um, so. I feel like a teacher here. <laughs> and, uh, exhibits to pass around. So um, what you'll see when you get the handout there is this is the uh, the the project plan. Uh, it's a Gantt chart, and now basically the project started last week. It's going to end on February, the mid February. It's a twenty week project, and there are four major phases. The first phase is uh, intelligence gathering, and in, in the intelligence gatherings phase, we'll be looking at the existing service landscape, the physical infrastructure. We're going to be get input from the unhoused, uh, as well as organizations and stakeholders, not only here in Montpelier, but across Washington County. We'll then do, uh, we'll, we'll identify needs and gaps, both in services and infrastructure. We'll do uh, an assessment of the intel and of the uh, gaps and, and needs. Then 
we'll put together a set of um, recommended approaches for addressing these gaps and do that in the context of best practices and looking at really high leverage approaches and very cost-effective ways to address these issues. And then finally, we'll put together a report that includes not only our recommendations, but our uh, best cost estimate as to these different phases. So that's my presentation. Um, are there any questions? I just to yeah, really appreciate the input in the ground running of this uh, project here. And he's um, talking to a million people. I've got them on speed dial. So um, thanks so much. For that. I've been making the circuit for sure. I actually have a question. Oh, and oh. Lauren's got a question for you. Go ahead. Thank you, Dan. Um, Likewise, Lauren. I guess my only question, so looking at the timeline, is there going to be information available to help inform the budget, knowing it's going to be like just slightly after we're going to have to have approved the budget? Is it going to be some kind of scope at least or something for us to act uh, We're going to do our best. Connor, who, of course, uh, and um, let's see, uh, Jennifer are on the homelessness task. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. OK. Connor is on the homelessness task force. <laughs> And uh, has has alerted me to the not only the budget but also I think the strategic planning process. So we're going to do our best to try to you know come up with prelim some preliminary recommendations, prelim preliminary estimates, so that we can you know, hopefully you know help inform the budgeting and the strategic planning process. And we did set aside a fairly large sum of money in this past year's ARPA funds for this process yeah. as well. So. Uh, wondering if you can just send this to me digitally. Yes, I will do that. that yep. And there's a few extra copies there if anybody would, would like one. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Great. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Oh, great. Great. Thank you. Uh, anyone else with us in person? Okay. We'll go to folks who are with us digitally. Uh, so, uh, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, Peter Kelman, uh, I live on um, Mountain View Street. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're going to be talking about this later. Um, I saw that under the disruption status sheet uh, mentioned about CAN. Will you be discussing CAN later? Or if not, I'll say something now. Not, not tonight. So if you wanted to say something about that now, that would be okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been a CAN coordinator in two different neighborhoods, where I, both of which I lived in, and cur my current one. Um, and uh, it's been a very uh, uh, interesting and I think important activity. Um, I'm very disappointed uh, that um, there are no longer any staff uh, for CAN uh, being provided by Sustainable Montpelier. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm not sure that all the coordinators have even been informed of what's going on. I only learned about it accidentally. And when I learned about it, I strongly urged Barbara Conry from the Sustainable Montpelier Board to get the word out to everybody to let them know. I didn't get uh, a notice. Um, so I don't know if anybody else did. I think we heard you. I think he's working on it. So sorry, Peter, if you could pause for a second. Um, if you would um, hold on a second. We're going to see if we can increase the volume. Peter, we'll let you know when when we're ready, okay? Okay. okay. Sorry? Through these speakers here. If you could. No, no, no. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Say again. Um, Stephen, if you could not make any further comments, um, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, without being recognized by me. Thank you. Um, so Stephen, if you're going to make offensive gestures, uh, I'm going to give you a warning. Okay, so that's your first warning right now. 
And and so I I'm going to give you a warning, second warning, and ask you to leave. Right? That's how it goes. Thank you. All right. Um, so Peter, if you could uh, <clears throat> give another shot here. Okay. Um, I don't know that any other coordinators aside from me um, know about this because I haven't I haven't seen anything that's been sent out. Um, the the staff that were that left left apparently sometime in August. We haven't heard anything from or about Can. We were used to having uh, at least once a month uh, communications to share with our neighborhoods. Um, I'll tell you quite frankly that uh, it's very clear to me anyway, that Sustainable Montpelier does not have the capacity um, as an organization to uh, fulfill the MOU that they signed with the city. Um, I gave them a plan uh, that I had come up with that, where they could do it without staff using uh, those of us who are uh, a coordinator volunteers to basically run, run the operation. Um, I got a very odd response from Ken Jones. He, he's apparently only interested in using CAN as a way of um, dealing with what he calls the um, um, BCFA project. I have no idea what that means, but that obviously does not involve, uh, uh, I mean, it mainly involves the two neighborhoods that are up there. Uh, Barbara Conry is very interested in ADUs and, you know, this, that's their interest. They don't have the real interest of what uh, the uh, the staff was doing, which is to uh, uh, pr promote community engagement in the political process. Um, we were piloting, we piloted two projects in uh, our, our district, District 3, uh, which I think were very successful. One was a candidate forum, and the second was a, um, uh, uh, a uh, office hours with our two city councilors. Uh, we were looking forward to having another one last month, um, but it didn't happen. And right now we're uh, in limbo. And what ha what happens to organizations that are in limbo? They start going downhill. Um, I urge you to act on this soon. I would be glad to send you the proposal that I sent to Sustainable Montpelier as to how this could be run without uh, a paid staff person. A part-time staff person is worse than no staff person at all, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else who is with us digitally wish to make a comment? You can use the reactions button, uh, the raise hand icon, uh, or you can unmute yourself uh, or turn your video on and wave. I see someone's connecting their audio. So I'm going to hold on a second. OK, all right. Uh, OK, so uh, since we're not seeing anybody else, um, I'm going to move on to uh, the consent agenda. Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Consent agenda. Second. OK, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? OK, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. All right, so the consent agenda passes. Uh, so now we are on to uh, some appointments. Uh, there are a number of folks who are uh, up for appointments, some of which I see are with us uh, online, um, which is great. Um, let me just check here. Craig Durham, I don't see. Um, Kirby Keaton, I do see. Kirby, would you uh, like to introduce yourself and um, I know you've been on the, the planning commission, but if uh, you could uh, tell us about uh, why you want to stay on. Hi, sure. Thanks, everyone. Um, hello, City Council. Uh, so, yeah, this is for a reappointment. And just to catch everyone up about how this is working for the planning commission right now is we missed some reappointments during COVID. Uh, so we in order to stagger things, we kind of did some reappointments last year and then my reappointment was set for one year just to start the staggering process. Usually it's two years. So that's why I'm back so soon. Uh, but I'm the, uh, I'm the chair of the planning commission uh, right now. We um, currently have five of seven seats filled. So we are actually looking for new members and hoping that you'll see new applicants um, 
And I would say if you know anyone who's interested in doing planning work, especially people with planning backgrounds or law backgrounds or related land use backgrounds, uh, we would welcome some new blood. Um, it would be helpful for us to get a quorum uh, if we have all of our seats filled. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm I'm here again, um, sticking around for a while. Uh, we're working on the city plan, as you know. We are well underway, um, close to finishing a first draft of the city plan. We have a few more smallest chapters. We also have a large land use chapter to do. Um, but we've, you know, contracted with SE Group to uh, start a web-based plan, and that is now underway with the draft chapters that we have so far. I um, just want to see that process uh, finish. Um, we're also working on uh, some zoning changes, uh, which is an ongoing process that we look at, you know, multiple times a year that I'm excited about uh, moving forward on. And we've also recently done some, you know, outreach about some of the stuff we're up to to let the community know more about what we're doing, which the, the web-based plan I just mentioned is also a big part of our, our outreach or, or hopeful outreach. So those are the things we have going on. I'd like to see these things through and that's why I'm planning to stick around. Okay, any questions for Kirby? Great. I would also say that I, I believe that there's an application from Gabe who's also up for reappointment and uh, he's been extremely helpful as vice chair. I know he's been busy with work so if he doesn't end up making it, I'd like to put in an endorsement for Gabe sticking around for us. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I just um, also want to say thank you for um, thank you for serving. And um, we're going to move on to other folks. I don't see Gabe with us on online or in person. Um, and so uh, we're going to move on to the ADA committee, Mary Alice Bisbee. I don't see Mary Alice uh, online or in person. And Michael Lazarczyk, uh, I don't see Michael online either. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, okay, I think that is, that's the, the list for a variety of committees. Uh, wondering if we would like to go into executive session. I guess I would, because we have a number of people to appoint, I would recommend it, but we don't have to. Yeah. Up to you. Go ahead, Jack. I don't feel the need to. Uh, okay, what that's... other people think. Yeah. I think these are all okay. Okay. Yeah, I that's think fine. these are all good uh, and non-controversial uh, applicants. And so, I'm going to do this really quick and and move that we appoint uh, Craig Durham to the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee, Kirby Keaton, and. Uh, Gabriel Lajanus to the Planning Commission, uh, Mary Alice Bisbee to the ADA Committee, and Michael Lazarczyk to the Conservation Commission. Okay, motion in a second. Any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, Kirby, for, for being here to uh, just check in with us. Uh, thank you for your um, past service and for stepping forward again. And please uh, pass along our gratitude to um, to Gabriel and uh, look forward to having the, the master plan done at some point. So thank you so much. And, and to the other folks, thank you um, to all the folks who are maybe listening um, for stepping up and serving. Okay, I think we are ready to move on then to uh, the uh, question about the request for a ballot item from Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice. And I know we have some folks uh, from CDHHH with us uh, digitally, Sandy Roost and Kim Farnham. Uh, so I am going to turn it over to you. Great. Oh, oh sorry. Maybe. Thanks, yes. Hold on one yeah. second. Maybe Bill first. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, so uh, last couple of years, we have, uh, during the pandemic, we have asked, uh, excuse me, CBHHH has asked us to place their ballot request, their funding request item on the ballot without requiring petition. Our normal process requires people to go through our community fund or petition, uh, one, or, one or the other. And uh, they have been, uh, prior to prior to the pandemic, they have uh, 
they had always petitioned successfully and, and gotten their ballot. I had them passed successfully. Obviously, during uh, the pandemic, I think everyone felt it wasn't safe for people to be out approaching people and doing petition work. So they requested from the council and received uh, our approval. And the council simply put their ballot item on the ballot, and it has passed with a very large majority the last couple awesome. of years. So they are here um, to make that similar request this year. So again, it's our we haven't changed our policy other than for um, pandemic exception, which you have, have granted. So this is where we're at. So over to you. Great. Yes, thanks, uh, Phil, and, and thanks, Nara Watson. So good evening, everyone. My name is Sandy Bruce. I believe I know pretty much all of you, except I believe Carrie, you're new on the council. So welcome. And I do have a few slides to share. Um, didn't know if I could share screen in a, in a couple minutes, if that was permissible or not at this point. Um, so the, the council members can see a share screen. The people in the okay. room at this point are only staff people um, would not be able to see. Okay. Um, I'd love for the council to see it if, if that's okay. But first of all, um, we are, as Bill said, um, Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice is asking for an exemption of Montpelier's petition rule to allow CDHH um, funding request, which would be level funded at 23500 to be a line item on the 2023 ballot. And um, lots of reasons why certainly it's certainly resource heavy um, to collect petitions. We found that through COVID, um, uh, many of our volunteers who did some of this work um, certainly have chosen to do other things and or not be as actively involved in that. I think we all know from a resource perspective as an organiza as organizations, um, whether we're municipalities or corporations, that resources are, are very, very thin. Um, so I, I just want to be able to take a few minutes just to tell you a little bit about what we've done in the last year. And then certainly I'm open um, for questions, et cetera. So I will attempt to share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So um, I don't think I need to go through, first of all, our mission. I, I think most of you, if not all of you are aware, we are a not-for-profit organization and we are um, designated by the state to accept all referrals for three of our major programs. Um, for our home health program, which is primarily our skilled care services, the skills of a nurse, physical therapist, all our rehab therapies, social worker, LNAs, et cetera, um, our hospice program, as well as choices for care. What that means is if we get a referral, for the most part, we have to take it. Um, so certainly talking about care for all of Montpelier residents, so agency-wide, last year, we served 3,100 clients. Um, and that's inclusive of a lot of the work we did for COVID. And, and last October, I was able to present on that. In addition, on any given day, we have about 750 to 800 individuals um, that are active on service. The key thing to note is um, in 2022, so far, we have served annualized 410 patients. That's actually an increase of 11%. So certainly continue to get out there and um, add additional um, patients to our census. And I think everybody knows the, the cost of, of doing that in our healthcare world is really related to having traveling clinicians on board due to re recruitment um, and retention efforts. So lots about Montpelier. Um, every year we choose a community partner of the year. This year it happened to be the Family Center of Washington County, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And um, we do lots of work with them. And certainly as more Montpelier residents qualify for CBHH services, not only are we able to meet the need just from the resources that we put into it, but also from our collaboration between our partnerships. And um, certainly Family Center in 2021 was significant. Um, we were able to serve lots of families and children in, in collaboration and coordination with the Family Center and many other organizations that serve that population. 
This past year, we've seen an increase in essential home health. Once again, those skilled care services, they require the skills of a nurse, rehab therapy, social worker, LNAs, et cetera. Um, similar to what <clears throat> hospital and primary care offices bill services, those same services, as well as our maternal and child health services. So very appropriate um, to have partnered and continue to partner with the Family Center. And certainly between all of us, we're really um, able to serve more individuals. Um, in that program for us in our, our maternal and child health program, we serve uh, pre-birth, so mom, pregnant moms, um, and also we serve individuals um, with family counseling with regards to parenting and certainly partnering with our OBs and pediatricians and in, in serving those children up to age two and some up to age five. So certainly wanting to support and maintain important connections to family and community. And a lot of that work is related to wellness initiatives as well from the nursing perspective. Certainly we want these families to thrive and we thought we'd highlight just a few things around this program that, that have touched your community significantly. Um, we are working on a perinatal collaborative pilot with um, an OBG practice with our maternal and child health nurses. And primarily what we're doing is outside of seeing these individuals where they qualify for the different programs we serve, we're also partnering with the physicians to do these 30 week home visits at no cost to the client or the provider, um, AKA the OBGYN offices. And we're conducting perinatal mood, anxiety disorder, and social determinant of health screenings. So as a result of doing that, we're able to partner with our physician practices, share that information with them, and then make appropriate referrals, certainly um, to all the organizations that we collaborate with in Central Vermont. And we do lots of lactation support as well um, in, in co conjunction with the practices. In addition to that, we have our maternal Early Childhood Sustained Home Visiting Program. That is a program funded by, through the Department of Health from a, a grant perspective. And once again, um, we partner with other providers such as the Family Center um, through this. And it's really an evidence-based home visiting program in the maternal and child health population that provides nurses to support families through the transition to parenthood and continuing support until the child reaches that, that second birthday. So really providing those wraparound services, wellness services, um, really working with families on how to provide that child a good environment to really um, begin their trajectory and certainly focused on how do we promote healthy behaviors, um, which we know starts at, at childhood and can potentially turn into chronic disease in the future. So really critical program. And um, just a comment that I, I think I've made to the city is that our work as Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice, when we do the history and, and go way back, actually started in the maternal and child health realm with nurses um, working with children in school systems. Sandy, can I interrupt you? you want, sure. We want you to assume that most of us do know what you do. Okay. <laughs> and um, certainly long history of voter support for town funding um, requests for um, Central Vermont Home Health. As Bill Frazier mentioned, we've had a significant amount of support. Montpelier is about 14% of our visits with the next highest and highest being Barry City. And um, certainly, you know, really partnering with community providers and health and wellness initiatives, et cetera. And why we need town funds. Um, certainly, I, I think you're aware of our um, primarily Medicare and Medicaid funding. Um, we certainly rely on town funding as well as investment income and fundraising development to support operational losses that we've sustained and that are significant um, from COVID moving forward projected to be as such as well. And that's all I have. And I am gonna unshare my screen. Great, thank you. Okay. My apologies for, for interrupting. I wasn't sure how long. Oh no, thank you. that's I okay. You that. were told to make it short, so I tried to make thank it as short as I could. Thank awesome. you so much. Yeah, thank you. Super. Um, Donna, yes, go ahead. I'm actually ready to make a motion and people can ask questions after that. Uh, that home health is on hospice is definitely known quality. 
and quantity. And I would like to make the motion that we allow them to put their ballot item on without signatures this year. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Other folks, folks with thoughts on this? I worked for the Family Center for a while, and I fully support this gesture. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, Carrie. Uh, I'm a huge supporter of home health and hospice. Um, I'm so grateful for the work that they do, and it's absolutely essential. Um, my question is about our process and that we have, we, we made a decision a few years ago that we were going to have this community fund and either you apply to that or you petition. And it makes sense to me that we made an exception for this during COVID, um, but I'm not seeing the argument right now for making the exception. So um, I'm very, very supportive of uh, home health and hospice. I would happily sign a petition. I would happily vote for them. Um, but I would prefer to see this go on the ballot by petition. Um, before you go, Donna, any other folks like Lauren, Connor? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think I'm on the same page as Carrie. It's not a question of worthiness. You know, I've had somebody on hospice in my own family in recent months, and there's no question about the work that's done here. It, it's sort of the equity issue. If I look at, like, who the community fund gives to, like Good Samaritan, Haven, which has more needs than ever, you know, or a, an organization that I was on the board of until recently, Mosaic. You know, there are these questions, like how many resources you put in to getting these like ballot signatures. And it's, as these folks are saying, it's substantial, you know? So I, I wonder if the question is maybe not about like picking and choosing who goes on the ballot and who not, who doesn't, but are, are we at the right level of petition signatures or is it an overwhelming burden for some organizations to get on? Because like, let, let's be serious, it's a, it's a pretty generous community, right? You're probably gonna get more on the ballot than you are gonna get from the community fund. I don't know, but you probably are if you ask for it. Um, so it becomes a strategic thing. And I wonder if we could take some of the strategy out of it by maybe a broader conversation about the signature requirement. That's I ask you a question about that. Um, it's not the the signature requirement is not state statute. That is our it's own. In, it's in the city charter. Okay. Uh, yeah. And our charter required it's five percent for a ballot item or ten percent for any money items, and uh, so this would be a ten percent threshold. And that was actually initiated by the council uh, in order to uh, discourage a frivolous, um, you know, requests. Um, I would also say you could have a discussion about um, the whole policy about how things go on the ballot for a long time. You may recall we had a time when there were a long, all sorts of uh, things on the ballot. And the council for some period of time had a, had a, uh, a policy where if you had been approved in prior years, they just put you in the budget. You know, if you'd already petitioned on, had been approved, and you weren't asking for a change, we just put you in the budget. It was only new requests or increased requests. And then that stopped. And then one year, the council said, nope, they all, they didn't require petitions, but they put everybody on the ballot. And that led to the community fund because there were too many items on the ballot. And that's where we've been. So I think you could also look at the amount of funding in the community fund, uh, if that's sufficient. One of the issues with the community fund, and I will say that CVHHH did apply one year, um, but their request is really out of uh, out of sort of whack with, uh, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, just the amount of money they've traditionally requested is way out of line with what the rest of the community fund people get. And so, you know, the, I think the the amount of reward they were given was substantially less than they'd been getting on the ballot. So they said, let's petition and get on the ballot. And and that's where they were. So there's there's a lot of history to all of this and a lot of good rational reasons why we've ended up where we've ended up. And to, to your point, um, we could look at any of those, whether it's the ballot requirement, which would require a charter change, uh, or the, the policy of how somebody gets on a ballot. Uh, for example, we have always um, or often our, our policy with the library is very specific to the library that, that if they ask for the same amount as the prior year, they go on the ballot. If they ask for an increase, they have to petition. Again, we waived that last year when they wanted an increase because of the pandemic. Um, so, you know, you could always make a policy that if you've gotten over 
eighty percent for five straight years. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I think there's any number of things that you could do. It's within your purview to think about how you want to handle it. So, but for now, lest we do that, um, your policy is either you go to the community fund, or you petition, or you get a special dispensation with the council. And again, that was granted the last couple of years because of COVID. Do we know what the thresholds are for other municipalities? The state statute is 5%. For moneyed items? For any items. For any, any for item any petitioned items. onto a town meeting Money morning. Moneyed or not. Right. And so the city, this city, and I think some others, up Increased. the money items to 10%. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Warren. It's roughly the difference between 600 signatures and 300 signatures, which I'm sure the city clerk would tell us if you were here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Here. So, oh, can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> um, I'm sick. I'm sick. Got to bear with me here. <laughs> um, was John going to go? Sorry. I will actually. John, did you want to jump in there at all? Um, I don't think I have anything particular to add. Bill's numbers are pretty close and they tend to float around there. So it would be probably around, oh, well, it's 600 and about 620 to get on the ballot for a moneyed item and about 310 for just an advisory item. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of of mixed minds. I mean, I... I'm inclined to grant the waiver, but with an understanding that I do think revisiting the policy could make sense. I mean, I to me, the pandemic is not over. And I mean, we're seeing in other parts of the world a resurgence. So this winter could be concerning. So I think, you know, with home health and hospice workers in particular, putting them at increased risk by unnecessary contact, um, you know, again, for an entity that we've given a waiver before that has won public support numerous times. So, you know, meeting certain criteria, um, you know, and just knowing what crisis our healthcare and public health providers are in. So adding an extra burden, um, I don't, I don't like, I am sensitive to the process issue though. This seems like if we're going to keep giving waivers, how long is the pandemic going to go on? Is this indefinite? So it seems like revisiting either putting more money into the community fund and just driving everyone through that. And, um, you know, maybe there's some acknowledgement if you've gotten uh, funding similar to the library where, you know, voters have approved it in, in amount, there's some kind of assurance that that could be um, in the budget or something and unless something changes. But um, I think for now I would support Donna's motion, um, but I, it does seem like a little bit of a messy <laughs> process. So, so just to be clear, so you would be in favor of it with the understanding that we come back to revisit the, the process? Yes. Okay. Thank you so um, much, Mark. No, no, fair enough. Well, um, Donna, you've been waiting to go ahead, and then I have a thought. Yeah. I just wanted to get into the history, and I'm glad Bill did. I, I remember just a little slightly different, whereas the council at last said, you're just too big for the fund. The fund people came to us, the community fund, and said, wow, they're just too big. And by and large, everyone is around the 10,000. So that's one of the things we could look at is just to make a certain amount. Anything over that goes to the ballot. I find it very strange that on one hand, we want public involvement. We want people to have more access to vote, but we don't trust them for us to put the item on the ballot. And that was the biggest thing with getting the public safety authority select boards to put it on the ballot so this public safety authority didn't have to go around to 23 towns and get signatures. I really support us putting, we can do a review of who's asking, but I support the council of putting organizations on the ballot, just like the library. They, and they increase it, they go on. They shouldn't have to get signatures. That's where I'm coming from. And I just find it really odd to be such of a different mindset. And, you know, I can't. Yeah, no, I guess, right, like my concern would be if uh, some other organization came to us and asked for a substantial amount of money and, you know, I'd like to be on the ballot, but they weren't on, they, they weren't approved before. I mean, we had, I feel like we, so we had a policy that was mostly just for the, the library previously, 
And it was two years. It was, it previously, that, it was two years. You had to get the same amount before you didn't have to petition. Yeah. And then the nonprofits got clever because I was yeah. part of it for public yeah. transit. We put everybody on the same signature ballot. So we all had our wording there and we all got on by group collecting signatures because you can do that. It's legal. So, so I, I guess, you know, just in, in light of like having a clear policy, because, you know, I, I, if, if we, we had a policy previously and well, at least we had something that we could point at and we've sort of uh, amended that for COVID. Um, so it, it seems to me that we ought to revisit that policy. Um, and, and to be to yeah, clear, ahead. also just you amended it for this one organization and for because of their ballot success, I think you were clear that any new agency would not be mm -hmm. exempted. Mm -hmm. And the same with the library and their in increase. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, you, if you did not open the door widely. Um, and to Donna's point, you know, one of the reasons that the then council put in the community fund um, was also for budgetary reasons, because if if you just put every request on the ballot, there's no check and balance. So I think the council said, hey, if we if we say here's how much money we'll put into these community activities, people can make the choice. They can still go out and petition if they want. But if they don't want to have to do that, then we at least can put some bounds around it. And and so I think that was the logic now different different times different policy different decisions but that was part of the issue was to give people were telling them hey we don't want a petition it takes too much especially for some of the people that get five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars and the council said yep we get it here's you know a hundred thousand dollars or whatever here's a group that will vet them and review them and we'll base them based on merit and then we'll we'll give grants instead that's yeah. how we got to where we go. Fair enough. Um, any further thoughts? Yes, Carrie. Yeah, I, I think that the system that we have now could stand to be relooked at just because it's always a good idea to review things after you've had them in place for a while. But I but I do think the general idea is pretty good that um that we have we have a sense of how much money is in the community fund and so we can budget accordingly. And then there may be some extras on top of that, but then those are kind of the special circumstances. And so asking people to petition to be on the ballot seems like it goes along with that idea of special circumstances. Um, and and I'm, 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 I'm thinking about what Connor said about equity and about all the organizations out there that are either going to the community fund now, but they would really love more money or could really benefit from a lot of money from the city, but don't know that they could come and ask for an exception. And so if we grant an exception because this group came and because we're familiar with them and um, that that doesn't seem very equitable. Um, and then the, the other part about they've demonstrated success in the past is really rewarding the folks who have been financially successful with more money. And it doesn't give an opportunity for those who haven't had that financial success to get it. Um, and so the thing about the petition and the community fund is it kind of puts everybody on sort of equal footing. It gives people a shot. It's clear what the process is. You can look it up and you can decide, do I want to go to the community fund? Do I want to petition? Do I want to try something else this year? And so I'm, I'm going to vote no because I really want to stick with that process. Yeah, kind of good. Yeah, just, I mean, just along those lines, you know, not the single Rick DeAngelis out, but Rick DeAngelis comes in here and says, hey, look, folks, we don't even have like a warming shelter. Like we are strapped for resources. You know, we need something from you. I, I'd have a tough time saying like, no, you can't go on the ballot, too, just because you haven't in the past here. So, again, it, like all these are organizations I want to see funded and everything, but I'm a little hesitant to put the cart before the horse until we have a process cemented and start picking and choosing. Because as far as I'm concerned, the floodgates are open once you do that. Um, I think organizations will be coming in, and they should. It's... So I just want to put it out there. We could table this until we have decided on a process or discussed the process. That's an option. Um, there are thoughts over here. Uh, Jennifer, go. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot. I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, 
And I feel like uh, the, the, the going around and getting signatures feels very um, dated. Um, I feel like, you know, if you have the bodies to go out and do that, and you have that privilege of having that many bodies to go out and get all those signatures, that's great. I know for me, when I was trying to get signatures, it was hard because I work, I have kids, I have other responsibilities and going out and knocking on my neighbor's doors, it took a lot of work. And I know a lot of these nonprofits are understaffed. The staff that they have are overworked and underpaid. And then asking them to go out in the weather with COVID still around and strep and God knows what else. I just feel like the knocking on the doors thing is, I feel like we should revisit. <laughs> Sorry. The, you're talking about the process, just the in process, general. Yeah, in general. I yeah. Just, I feel like it's, it's dated. Okay. For where we are. Yeah. Just health and just everything in the world. Privilege. And the, and the tension in the world and is it safe knocking on people's doors right now in this political climate? Mm. You know? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Jack. This is uh, a very interesting uh, conversation between things like the philosophy of how we operate government. Do we have a policy or we do not? Do we not have a policy? And it is always open if you start a prep pattern of giving a waiver year after year after year when is it does it look like there's not actually a policy or the waiver is the policy um to you know, donna raises the question of well what is uh <clears throat> the voice of the how do we conduct a demo democratic uh, election and wh whether it's more democratic and more uh open to the uh, to the voice of the people if the uh, council simply puts something on the ballot that we want to or if we encourage public uh, participation by asking uh, organizations to uh, to go door to door and uh, establish that there's support uh, in, in the in the community I think I think it's I, I agree with the people who've said that it's really worth uh, revisiting the uh, the policy and coming up with uh, what we think is a rational policy you know and i appreciate the uh, the history of how the community fund was was developed and i really was uh, was not a supporter of that change when it happened because and it kind of happened without me even noticing it but uh, I wasn't on the council at the time. It was years ago, but uh, it struck me. It seemed to me that it was uh, one of the purposes for creating the community fund was to make our budgeting process less democratic by uh, closing the door on uh, organizations who, who wanted to come in to uh, to ask the voters for money because the the uh, community fund and the increase to 10% uh, signature requirement, I think, were part of the same package. No? Okay. Um, thanks for the correction. But so um, I, I think it's a tough thing to do, but I also think that uh, Home health and hospice is a is a very valuable organization. I agree with uh, Lauren that the uh, that the pandemic is is not over. So uh, for this year, oh, and then one other thing is that I don't think we have time to uh, lay this on the table and adopt something new because they're going to want to be out there. Uh, knocking doors before it gets too cold if uh, if that's what they're going to have to do so i'm, I'm going to support this because i think it's a worthy organization but i do think that uh, we really need to take a close look at how we're going to do this in the future you know just, just from what you were saying jack it was making me think about what would it ideally look like next year and um 
I think it it ought to be a, we ought to have a policy that's clear enough that uh, the folks from CVHHH would know what to expect. Um, and I don't think we would, uh, even if we had a policy, I don't think it could, it would preclude us. I don't think it would um, be a policy that would um, allow them to not be approved by the council. I think we'd probably, if we were going to give them a waiver, it would still probably have to be approved Correct. by right. the council. Right. So, But it could be on the consent agenda if it was a really clear Correct. The, so the council policy. Is, is the one who sets the ballot when you set the warning, except for petitioned items. And uh, I'd argue, and, and obviously the folks from, from CVHH can speak for themselves, but I, I would argue that the policy for them was very clear, which is why they came in the last two years and this year said, we know we need to petition. We're concerned about the pandemic. Can we be relieved from that? that question. I don't think it was an unclear policy. I think they are very appropriately asking for an exception to the policy due to health circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's you can choose to grant that or not. And the conclusion of that is then they will do, you will either put them, on, you're agreeing to put them on the ballot mm -hmm. when you set the ballot in January, or you're saying to them, you need to get this petition. Um, just to dial back a little bit about the the ten percent is, I, I, again, I think we could spend a lot more time on this, but just remember, a money item can be any amount, and so um, I think what actually prompted the um, the increase was there was a very large, I want to say fifty thousand dollars or something. It was might have been for the hockey rink, something. There was a, a very significant amount that was able to be. Uh, brought in at five percent, and so, and also that was the amount that you could overturn money items that the city had passed. So you get three hundred votes and have a revote, and so the council reset all that at ten percent um, to make it more difficult for people to, you know, sort of w get money easily, uh, large sums of money, or disrupt council votes. So I, I don't think it, that was necessarily. Um, connected to the, the community fund. I think they were different things. And if you were to revisit that charter change, you might, I, I would recommend at the time that maybe for requests up to X number of dollars, it's 5% and everything over that is, you know, a higher amount because, uh, but obviously you could do what you want. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to do what I, I think, but I, it, you know, once the, that that ten percent is for any sum of money that anybody can petition for, um, including I think there's even a there may be a provision for bonds even in the in the statute. But they, um, now and and can I just say one more thing to to Council Members Morton's a point about um, it being dated. Um, I don't know, and maybe the city clerk can weigh in on this. But at this point in time, we don't allow. I don't think uh, digital petitions are still are acceptable yet. However, it is very clear in state statute that, you know, people's ability to petition the government in, in Vermont for these kinds of things is something we have to allow. And I suspect that if we were to seek to remove that altogether from our charter, we would not be approved by the legislature. It is a pretty strong tradition. So while I, I tend to agree sort of philosophically that it's an a outdated or a dated procedure, it is a bedrock of sort of Vermont governance. So does that mean that it might be useful to put that on a, like a legislative agenda to allow for digital uh, I would petitions? Defer to the clerk got this. Yeah, John, go ahead. Um, yeah, digital uh, signatures were discussed for a number of reasons. Uh, a number of reasons that I agree with. They were they were rejected. Um, I would also mention just because otherwise I'll kick myself from a perspective of only being in the meetings um, while those two items the community fund and well and in the writing the minutes the community fund and the uh, 10 percent increase were obviously very very different processes but they were often spoke to as part of a combined strategy they were they were sort of part and parcel as presented by the mayor and a few of the councilors at the time in my memory, that, that feels um, 
that feels correct. But I can go back and check the minutes on that too. I, I was one of these different mayors, so maybe we, maybe we should check the record. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And then Connor, did you have something? Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing that occurred to me that that was is part of this conversation is that uh, either the community fund board itself or various members of the community, if they thought that the the total pot that we're allocating to the community fund is too too low they could be coming in at budget time and saying or some earlier time and say we don't think this is enough money given the established documented need for the for the people that are coming in and and they can say we'll make it higher that is that's what i remember um connor and then terry uh, was that was the library the only other organization who got exempt from last time I would uh, just throw it out there. I would add a friendly amendment to extend the same thing to the library just for consistency's sake this year and limit it that with Lauren's point that, okay, I've been knocking on a lot of doors where people open and say, I have COVID, I can't come out, you know? It, it is still a real, but while we come up with a process, just extend the same to both organizations that have previously been on the ballot. Is that what I, as as level so, so the library... Do you think these things are simple, right? So our policy with the library has been separate and distinct from, from CVHHH. The library, because they're so large and because they are a quasi-municipal, you know, function, so to speak, the city has allowed them to place an item on the ballot without petition if it's the same amount as the prior year. And the, the city council policy has been if you are increasing your amount, you need to petition. So that, again, it was kind of a budget control measure. Uh, as long as you're holding the line, we'll, we'll make it easy for you. And if you're increasing, you've got a petition. Last year, the library had a fairly significant increase on the budget, but they asked that they not have to petition even with the increase because of COVID. So I, it's a little bit different thing. Uh, um, so at the exemption that they were granted last year. So I think to Donna's point, they haven't asked us yet um, whether, you know, so to, I, I, while I think that's a good idea to keep in the back of our pocket, I, I'd suggest we not include that in this motion because we might be just giving them a blank check. Fair enough. Fair enough. Carrie, you want to um. Yeah, so following up a little on what Jack said about um, people could come to us during budget time and say the community fund should be larger, they could also petition for that, uh, right? And so um, I, I think I, I'm really intrigued by the discussion about what's more or less democratic. I feel like the petition process is extremely democratic because it does not rely on coming to a small group of people and making your case. It does not rely on, you know, the seven opinions that are sitting here it relies on community support. And so we can say, we want the budget to be X and the community could say, well, we think you're completely wrong and we wanna make it Y and they have the power to do that, which seems like kind of the essence of the democratic process to me. So I, um, so for that reason, I, uh, I am reluctant to deviate from our, our set process. Um, I'm, I'm open to the idea that COVID is still enough of a factor to make knocking on doors something we don't necessarily want to ask people do, to do. In that case, I think we have to take it off the table as a requirement for everybody. I don't think there's anything particularly special about this one group that shouldn't be exposed to COVID or spreading COVID. It, that's true for everybody. And so if, if COVID is the concern, then we should just remove the petition requirement. And I don't know what that would mean in terms of our procedure, but if that's the rationale, then it applies to everybody because it affects everybody. Maybe I'm the only one, but when I'm gathering signatures, whether it's my own or somebody else, I say, you don't have to vote for me. I'm just asking to be on the ballot. And that's what every nonprofit who petitions for money, you don't have to vote for it. You, I just, we just want the opportunity to be in the ballot. So. I see a signature on a petition much more distant than an actual vote on a ballot item. That's why I, I made that difference. I don't know if I'm explaining it well, but it just it's a different attitude when you sign a petition 
is when you vote for something. So that's why I made a difference. Okay, uh, Jack. I totally get what you're saying, Carrie, that why make anyone petition? And my feeling is the why we would make someone who hasn't gone on it before is that they, they don't have the uh, established support that uh, home health and hospice does. So so it's it's a combination of factors. It's the established support plus the reluctance to make people go out, although really I don't have any problem with collecting signatures. I do appreciate the, the sentiment that COVID is still uh, a factor in our community. Uh, to even just these last couple of weeks, I feel like I have known more people with COVID in the last two weeks than um, than like the previous two years. So that that could be uh, a real thing for sure. Um, other thoughts? Okay, um, Lauren. I guess just kind of along what uh, Jack was just saying. I mean, I to me an exception in this case is this is a group that has gone out in the past, gotten signatures, demonstrated that there is community support, gotten strong votes. So just opening it to anyone, um, you know, so if we can minimize, you know, it's, it's a step of not asking a group that's going into a lot of vulnerable people's homes to go out and collect signatures. Um, I agree. So, I mean, I, to me, it doesn't seem like inconsistent to allow the same exception that we did last year. Um, and, you know, ag again, I still think this larger conversation of the process still seems if we have to have these conversations every year, <laughs> something we probably could do better. Yeah. Right. Okay. I, I am getting the sense that we need to talk about the process. I think we're all agreed about that. Uh, so fair enough. Um, any further thoughts on this? Um, yeah, Connor, go ahead. I think I'm with Carrie. I think I'm all or nothing, you know. If it is COVID, everybody should be afforded the same opportunity. Needs change from year to year, and needs change particularly during a pandemic like this. It's Okay, okay further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? No. no. Okay, so uh, I believe that was four to two, so uh, the motion passes. So um, thank you, uh, Sandy and Kim, for being here. And um, yeah, robust discussion. We appreciate, <laughs> one thing I think we were all agreed about is that we very much appreciate the work that you all do. Um, so so thank you. Thank and, you, Anne. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, and Thank you uh, to the council. I appreciate it. And certainly I understand Carrie and, and Connor, um, you know, process and, and all of that. We we all have to follow it. Um, I, you know, good Sam is here and, and close to my heart. I have a homeless brother. Um, so very familiar with the needs out there and um, our staff serve those individuals and, um, you know, support DEI and making sure there's equity in healthcare. So, um, you know, we just don't have the resources and everything that's been going on. This is a, a significant dollar amount to our budget. Um, and with Medicare cuts coming down in the, the realms of half a million to $700,000 for our organization and a commitment to try to increase our minimum wage and align with the state um, and provide paid leave and, and all those things to all our employees, um, these dollars that support that are significant and our ability to grow our census um, is there. It's not like we're cutting service. Um, so appreciate the process, appreciate listening to all of the comments and suggestions. Sandy and Kim, please don't take a no vote for a lack of appreciation for the great work. Yeah. Seriously. Thank you. Oh, no, I, I'm not. I, I'm just really trying to recognize that I understand what you're trying to do. And um, it's just a, a really tough time. And these dollars are significant to us. We, we actually didn't qualify for a lot of the dollars that were given to the healthcare system. So. Thank you. Um, thank you for your work. And um, 
Uh, I just want to acknowledge that we I will have the process in general on the agenda for another another time. Um, and just um, just thinking about that, uh, I mean, one of the things that just this, well, actually maybe we can talk about setting that up. I think I think some other time. A quick question, and maybe we can talk about it later. Is do you want to do this for this year's budget cycle? Are we talking about for the future? Because if we're going to do it for this year, we probably should do it at the next meeting. And if we're going to do it for the future, then we have some time. I sort of assume that we're talking about the future and not this this okay. year, right? Because it also just anticipating that nobody else necessarily is going to be in the boat right. that CBHHH and the library are. So um, that's great. Yeah, because we have a lot of models that we've done over the years. <laughs> okay. The outside agencies used to be on our agenda almost every year how to do them. They would sometimes change from year to year. So it actually has been a pretty consistent policy for a while. So it's, <laughs> so it's about time to <laughs> shake it up, right? Okay. Super. Thank you. All right. So I think we are ready to move on then um, to the second reading of the uh, Parklet Ordinance. So I'm going to open a public hearing on the um, second reading of the Parklet Ordinance. Um, I'm gonna assume that nobody in person would like to make a comment. Um, note, yes, go ahead. You know, for the public and for the council that the only changes from last meeting were taking out the requirement that parklets be public during the off hours. And we did add the word that we encourage people to make them public, but not require them. So I, I think it was consistent with your direction. Everything else is the same. Yep, I was, um, these were the changes that were made. Um, any, anyone either online or council wish to weigh in on this? I did, I, I opened the um, public hearing. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Magic words were said. Um, Con uh, Lauren, I just called you Connor. <laughs> we're <laughs> easily confused. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, my only, so in the per amended change um, in the um, public, so section 20-7B, um, I feel like the sentence, this does not preclude the owner from storing tables and chairs. Like if we're saying it may be restricted and then they can store it. it I just don't think that next sentence actually makes sense anymore to be included. And sorry, I should have sent this change, um, but kind of noticed it late. But I actually struggle with it. I think we just, I would just strike it because I think it doesn't make sense anymore now that we're saying that you don't have to leave it open to the public, but you are encouraged to. And of course, if it doesn't have to be public, you can lock down your tables and chairs. On thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. Um, if 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 it's going to add a lot of time to our procedure to change it, it's no, not necessarily just, worth you it. You can but... just move it to, to approve it tonight with that amendment, oh, yeah. and then we publish it. With okay. A new... Then I would move we strike the sentence. This does not preclude, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a second. That whole sentence. That, yeah. That that sentence. And uh, so this is not approving the whole policy. This is just striking the sentence. Um, further discussion about that. Any comes from the public? Okay. Uh, further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so taking that sentence out. Um, any other comments from folks? Uh, well, anybody online wish to make a comment about this in general? Okay. Uh, council? Would anybody like to make a motion? Actually, I'm going to close the public hearing because apparently nobody <laughs> wants to talk about it. So, um, uh, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank planning staff who are here. They really did a huge amount of work on this. So, thank you. glad they could great. be here for that. It was great improvements. All right. Okay, we are up to discussing the um, 
uh, project update for our 203 Country Club Road, the, the master planning process. And I know we've got uh, Stephanie Clark here uh, from uh, White and Burke. Uh, I assume you, there's something we, you yeah, want to say so here? I, uh, I'll very briefly tee this up. Uh, Stephanie is here from White and Burke, who's our project manager, as well as Josh Jerome and Mike Miller from our planning department. Uh, Josh is our lead staff person on this project. Uh, uh, at the last meeting or the meeting before, we uh, had presented some thoughts on public process. And I think I will own that, that it wasn't clear that those were really meant to be on top of what was already happening. So understandably, there were some some pushback or feedback. So we wanted to be clear about what was happening. And as you've seen, we've already started some, some processes. So uh, you have the memo from Stephanie and our team is here. And I think Stephanie's prepared to just give you a brief overview and then answer any questions. And hopefully, you know, we can take any last suggestions or if or not, hopefully, and move forward and everyone feels more comfortable with where we're at. So I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. And I have questions, so <laughs> just to warn you, to be on the hot seat. Um, do I, oh good, I have the ability to screen share. Is that okay, Mayor? Oh, yes. Great. So thank you, everybody, for, for having me here tonight. Um, I will pull up a, I'm sorry? Um, just a quick question. Does everyone in the room believe the projector? Seth's here to actually fix the projector. Um, otherwise, the rest of us can see this, and I think anyone watching can see this on their screen. We can't see it in the room. So okay. I just wanted to ask if we wanted to take a pause while we fix the projector. Sorry, Stephanie, we have a, we have a projector problem here in the room. Not That's on okay. Room. That's okay. Um, one possibility is that um you you all here in the room are okay not seeing the presentation or would you you have it you have hard copies um so seth is is it uh, reasonable to think that um stephanie can continue to present while you are working to fix things yeah okay so we don't necessarily need to like pause while okay. you're we'll understand that you're doing some work and that's great thank you thank you Okay. Um, all right, Stephanie, I think we're good. Uh, okay. We and the council can see you and everybody else. Okay. Has, and Zoom can see you. And so um, okay. everybody else has hard copies. So. Okay. Um, and I'm pretty sure my cat boom box will not interfere, but she did just whine. So if she does, I'll just try to evict her real quick. But she has made lots of appearances, I think, in front of city council actually in the past. So here we are um, back again. Um, thanks for having me here tonight and um, for taking up this, this next step of our process and just reviewing it and helping do a little bit of brainstorming here as we make our way through this step. I'm going to go through the overall mas uh, master timeline, which I had we, we should have done in our last memo and I would have presented at the last meeting, but just to give you a sense of where we are and where we're going and then do a little bit more on a recapping what we're going to be doing over the next few months and a little bit more information about those next few steps that I'm calling the phases winter and spring, um, just walking you through some of the process as well as how the public piece dovetails and merges with the land use piece. So again, I'm Stephanie Clark from White and Burke, and our team is comprised of VHB and Black River Design. They're not heavily involved in this uh, outreach component. They're right now running concurrent on the due diligence piece. So they're not here tonight, but um, if you had any specific questions for them, I'd be happy to bring them back to them. So here's our, here's our timeline. And just to remind everybody, this started back in the spring. I'm from Rhode Island, we consider March the spring. Um, and that was when I uh, recall and understand there was a robust process there. Um, and then over the summers when the city issued the RFP and our firm and our team was hired in August to begin work on October 1st, we were asked to jump in a little early. We did in September, we're in the fall process now to um, really take up a bigger community input um, process regarding prioritization of uses and um, a more extensive outreach to solicit more feedback. Concurrently, there'll be the due diligence and analysis piece that's running 
um, kind of behind the scenes to get understanding around the actual um, site characteristics. And then the spring, the, the, this will be working up toward a winter process of um, the really the opportunities and constraints plan, which is a kind of high highs and lows of the site, the pros and cons of the site, and talk about some of the the characteristics of the site, and then layered with uses and public input. And that will be the time when we go and do a bigger deep dive with a public component. I'll get into some of this a little bit more um, in a few slides on this winter and spring piece, but um, then the spring piece will follow once we have feedback on those, on the, you know, and direction from the community and from city council onto the concept planning and scenarios. So here in fall, um, a big focus on community input will be going, I'll be going back in, going into depth on that in a minute here in another slide. But we also plan to come back to city council. What we heard at the last meeting was really trying to keep this very top of mind. And we hear that that's important because um, so often there's a lot of process and then things go dark and there's not um, a lot of communication. So we wanna come back to the council once we have input and kind of summarize that. And then meanwhile, we're doing this due diligence that includes natural resources inventorying, um, land characteristics such as topography and the primary ag soils, archeology, span and that will be part of what we present in the winter. So as you know, in the spring, there was a, um, a lot of public input that came through to City Hall and they put together and compiled folders full of feedback, both from the uh, live Zoom session as well as everything that was sent in. So we've reviewed all of that and there are some themes um, that rise to the top, of course, housing and recreation, which is what it was put out to the voters for, um, but also suggestions around environmental conservation and agriculture, um, educational uses and some and even retail. Now, uh, the feedback ranged and some of it was diametrically opposed. So you've got people saying no recreation, only housing, some housing, no recreation, and um, everything in between, which represents, of course, the diversity of opinion and um, interest and stakeholders in the community for this land. And so it will be, um, we will continue right now this process of trying to hear all of that and find where the um, a lot of the energy is going among those buckets and try to see if we can find common themes and try to distill that feedback as much as we can. This process though at, that we're taking on now is not just listening sessions, which we had um, you know, started that had been started in the spring, but also really trying to get at what, what would you like most? I mean, it is a finite, piece of property, it can't be everything for everybody. So what, what do people wanna see most? And are there um, some points of consensus already that are emerging? And the point of this stage and the outreach plan that we're talking about um, here is really to provide, to seek input and really seek out, not just provide opportunities, but seek out input from various sources and from all residents in the community. So uh, again, hearing what we heard in September from feedback um, from the council and from the public, this outreach plan now includes live feedback sessions. These have been very well advertised. The city has done a great job of getting out to different, um, different ways of getting the message out and offering the sessions in different formats so that people can access at different times of the day that might work with their schedule in different places that might work for accessibility. Um, those sessions are going to be, again, listening sessions and a bit of education about what the site is. And then there's going to be more targeted outreach. So small stakeholder groups um, working with the housing committee, working with the equity committee, reaching out to Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, Montpelier Alive, and really doing an outreach to different groups to see how else we can get to the community at large. And so it's a targeted and widespread effort. Having uh, open access 
Josh's email address is going to be <laughs> blasted everywhere. We already have it on the flyer that went out for the live sessions. It'll be on the flyer we distribute at these meetings doing tabling. That'll be, um, again, a, piece, a time for outreach, but also a time to offer opportunities for input. Um, tabling at farmers market and on election day. Those were two suggestions I think out of the last meeting that um, were good ones that we've lined up. And um, having the communication flow, um, Evelyn has put together a really solid communications plan with both social media and front porch forum, but also updates to the website itself. And so we're working on those website updates this week currently. Um, and those should, there should be a, um, a more easily navigable part of the site soon so that people can get to it from the, from the homepage and then um, that it'll be a comprehensive page within the website. And, and then the bridge articles as well, doing um, updates regularly in the bridge. There's also a sign up to a newsletter that will go out so people can offer their email. And Evelyn will be at the live sessions to take people's names when um, they're at the session if they haven't signed up for the newsletter already, and that those signups can be at the tables as well. Um, I'm going to pause and I'm going to ask the council for two questions. And if you have ideas, that's great. If you want to think about it and come back to it at the end, that's fine too. But um, I am curious if there are any other suggestions about um, where to be present, who to contact, ways to inform you know your neighborhoods much better than I do. Um, and so I'd be curious those thoughts. And the other question I have is around the name of the site. Um, I had heard some uh, background that the Elks Club, it, it's no longer the Elks Club. Is that a, a suitable title for it? It's 203 Country Club Road. Is that the right name for it? That's a mouthful. So does anyone have any opinions about those things? Because the time for the change is maybe quickly going by. <laughs> so I'd be curious if the council has any opinions on those things. Oh, I can't hear anything. I don't know if anyone else can. I can't. Hmm. I don't hear anything. I don't know. Okay, can you can you say something? You can hear me or no? We can hear you. Yay! <laughs> yes. Okay, wonderful. We can Thank hear you. you. You can hear us. Yes. Um, sorry. It looks like you were gonna say something. And no, I was just gonna refer to Donna's excitement. She had ideas. I saw that Donna was very excited to answer those questions. That's all I was gonna say. <laughs> That's great. That's um, great. Um, and then I'll put my slideshow back up when I get going again. Cool. Um, Donna, do you have ideas that you'd like to share? I, I was thinking along the same lines. And so I just sort of ran, went around the room and a gentleman that actually belongs to, I'm sorry, I don't know your first name. Sure. Josh mentioned, I was thinking Falcon Road, but he mentioned Deer Run Road. And I thought, wow, we have Deer, we have Run for Action. I thought that would be a great name for this road and then we could think of other streets within the complex that also could be animals and then jennifer mentioned that in the day we could look at abernacky words but i maybe if we could start with something naming the project even if we didn't say the word road or just say deer run project and then make a decision about the road specifically later it's much better than what we have now as an address yeah fair yeah you can call site you know, you can call it the deer run site or, you know, something um, legacy site, you know, and so, you know, fill in the blank there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I I uh, would just also say I'm, I'm interested in, you know, some potential um, uh, Abby Naki name. Um, I think that would be, I think that'd be great. Um, other thoughts? Yes, Carrie. Hi, Stephanie. Hey. Nice to see you. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you've done on this. And um, I, I don't have any thoughts at all about what to call this 
place, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> but um, one thought about how to reach some various mm -hmm. people, maybe yeah. their connections through the schools, uh, through the, um, mm -hmm. the parent the association. I forget what they're called. Um, mm -hmm. And there may be through the after school programs. There may be through some of the uh, the preschool programs in town. Those are, are ways that you might reach some people who are um, not necessarily uh, subscribing to newsletters from the city and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Thanks. Um, on the outreach point. Um, so we, I mentioned at previous city council, um, which you probably saw, but the um, social and economic justice advisory committee of the city um, mm -hmm. has been doing some thinking, really looking at work that we did through the community equity assessment to do really um, targeted outreach to reach people that are often left out of these types of processes. Mm -hmm. So there's some thinking that they're putting together that they're, um, we're going to, I think we meet next week so we can look at kind of how far we've gotten with that, but hope to connect with you soon. Um, a lot of that was like um, affinity groups and other things mm -hmm. and we can kind of build on that work and outreach that was already done to try to um, reach additional folks. And so. We'll and that's CJAC, right? CJAC. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Josh has that on his list. Um, I don't know if he, yeah. Um, not sure if he, he probably doesn't need to provide a full update right now, but yes, absolutely on the list. Oh, good. Sure. Hi, Stephanie. Hi. Uh, maybe just like um, I was thinking along the same lines as Lauren, but uh, maybe different. We, we have so many standing committees in city government mm -hmm. here. Would it make sense to have like a Zoom meeting or something with all the chairs of them just to kick this mm -hmm. off? And say, OK, this progress process is going through, you know. You'll have an opportunity to discuss this with your committee and by a certain deadline, get back to us with any ideas you have. Because I could see like uh, CJAC, you know, I mean, Jennifer has always talked about like a multicultural center or something. Maybe they want to throw something like that on the table. Definitely housing mm -hmm. committee is going to want to. Homelessness committee, maybe. So I, I think we mm -hmm. have a wealth of like, you know, uh, knowledge and ideas in these committees. And we just have to make sure to tap them in sort of a formal manner. That's sure. Yeah, it could be done in a in a bigger group setting versus what we've been doing, which is tapping individual chairs. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Jack, go ahead. Um, this isn't uh, a group that that I'm really connected to, but uh, th there's a whole bunch of churches in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I suspect that most of them have some kind of uh, newsletter Letters. And so that might be a way to reach out to uh, people who may not be paying attention to uh, to our meetings every uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just I thinking tap back to the city to find out if anyone does have um, some connections. I know we, I, Bill and I worked closely with Christchurch when we were working on the down town project um for but you know trying to find who the leaders of those organizations would be that um to connect with um i don't know if this is a reasonable idea but you know just trying to think about the population of folks that may not be able to participate otherwise and i, I think about like the meals on wheels program that the city has you know folks that mm -hmm. maybe aren't mobile enough to come out to a meeting and may not be very tech savvy. Um, mm -hmm. So just wondering if we can uh, put something together that would be a, you know, like a, like a survey or, you know, some way to just yeah. gather some pretty straightforward feedback. Um, to yeah, we do have that. A meal um, that right. is going to be delivered uh, to somebody's house. Yeah, we do have that polling um, capability, um, and we could put that together with, um, a, we, we're going to have a flyer that kind of is an educational two-sided flyer that, you know, can go out at all the tabling and all those live sessions, possibly in, um, you know, just lots of different venues, having the committees, having, um, Montpelier Alive distribute it, you know, to its members, you know, just trying to find people to distribute it as far as they can, and that could 
refer back to a survey, but yeah, putting it, so it's hard when, yeah, when there's a, if there's a print component to that, <laughs> that can be really challenging. Um, so. you know, to see like how many people are we talking about? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Um, other thoughts from the, about either the name or ways to connect. I'm sure you might have other questions too, and I can get through the rest of my slides and then, you know, be open for questions after that. You know, Connor and then uh, Peter Kelman. So is there any like sort of canvassing component on that, you know, hiring a group just to, I, I don't think anything beats knocking on doors, you know, and uh, it, it did actually seem like something that maybe can, could do the, the update we got earlier, mm -hmm. but I can't. Um, but yeah, just just a thought. I mean, one yeah. if it's just leafleting, one person could do a hundred doors a day. Team of five hundred. I, I want to pin that because I'm not sure that is as um, useful in this particular stage. Again, because we don't have substantive uh, concepts for people to respond to. I'm thinking that is a very important tool when you have two or three scenarios with different, very different options options that give people with different possible price tags where people really can weigh out the various you know uh, again pros and cons there um that that can help guide then city council's decision um to give the direction that the master plan will take and so you know at this stage where we're just collecting all all the feedback and, and, you know, really in the sponge phase, as we call it, you know, just kind of absorbing all the ideas and trying to understand what those themes are. Um, you know, it, it's not like we're going out for a vote right now or anything to get, a, to even prioritize on a list of one to 10. It's still kind of filtering in all of those ideas. So I would argue canvassing and, and getting out more of that kind of, that particular survey to like a poll, I think will come in really useful in the next winter and spring right. phases. Thank you. Um, Peter, come on, go ahead. Uh, I, I would just like to underscore what uh, Connor's mentioned twice, once in a previous meeting just now. Can would be an ideal way to reach into the neighborhoods all over the city at, at every stage to let them know, for example, about the three meetings in case people, I'm, I've got people in my neighborhood I'm sure we don't know about the three meetings, but I could let them know. But you guys need to act on can. Can can do a lot here, but not if it doesn't exist. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just because it was a question, the uh, the parent group for the schools is the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools Partners in Education, um, or PI. Yeah. Um, other other thoughts. Okay. So back to the one. name for yeah. a second. Um, yeah. In terms of, um, does the city council have a direction for what we should use in the meantime? Because we've we've got Elks and we've got to go three country club until further notice um should we just stick with one or the other um i want to make it so that people know what we're talking about because everyone knows it by elks probably the most so i want to be consistent with my nomenclature and our outreach plan okay. you don't have a group uh determination i don't think i like to call it just country club road for now um during the break one of the things we were talking about was well is there an abenaki word and uh and so i quickly looked up the abenaki word for deer and it's nolka n-o-l-k-a which is not a hard word to pronounce unlike some words so that's that's good but but i would suggest we just call it country club road i don't think we need to use the number and that's because yeah, obviously there will be different roads when when we in there when we get there, but that that that's what I did. Okay. We can do that. That's fine. <laughs> Country Club Road works. Um, feelings otherwise. 
exercise and then just, you know, pinning it as an idea for maybe a public process of naming at some point in the future for the council. That's not within my scope. So I, I do, I do like the idea of uh, using, like I said, an Abenaki word, but I would want to check um, with uh, some in, in, uh, indigenous Abenaki, yeah, with an elder, yes, with an elder, before we did that. And, you know, in part, it, it feels like whatever we start to call it now might just stick and be harder to change later. Uh, but I also, I think there's some process there if we're going to go with a um, Nabanaki word. So, um, can, I would say though that um, for those of you that have been around for a while, for for years we talked about the car lot oh, yeah, project, and it was very well known as the car lot. And then once the city purchased it, we changed the name to One Taylor Street, mm -hmm. and then um, and then it just became known as you know it took a little while, but then people just started calling it One Taylor Street. So I think at some point, would you say this is the okay. the new name? I I, I particularly since. And I, I would, you know, not that I vote, but I think using an Abenaki term that that those here, an elder here, would say was appropriate for that property would make sense. But it's so if you were to stick with Country Club Road, that's what everyone already knows. That's not mm -hmm. a change, really. It's mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. calling it that mm -hmm. instead of taking the number out. So you, you probably still have one more change left. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's just my no, opinion. That's not a determinative, dispositive no, 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 opinion. No, no. Fair. Yeah, Carrie. Yeah, I, I agree with Bill, except that um, I, I think I still call it the car lot. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Old habits die hard. But um, I, what about the country? Yeah. <laughs> what about the country club road site? Um, that sounds because people are already calling it the something, the Elks Club, the you know, and so calling it country club road sound just it it's subtle, but to me that sounds more like a name than the country club road site. Sounds kind of temporary. Sounds like this is just what we're calling it now, and then we can have a process where we decide what to actually call it. We can't figure that out right now, but that's what I would advocate for, for in the meantime. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense to me. Does that answer your question sufficiently? Yes, it does. No? Thank okay. you. Yeah. Just, I keep doing elks on everything with quotes and it's awkward. So I'd much prefer this. That sounds great. Um, again, it is, it's temporary until, you know, a better process can come forward, I think. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, I'm going to finish up here. Um, not too many more slides, but um, let's see. We're going to go into this, if you can see my screen. So, um, yes, so thank you for that. So the last, um, you know, few pieces here are what to expect after the this current phase of kind of gathering and seeking out input from folks from all over Montpelier is then to digest that data and digest those, that input and layer that along with what we find from the due diligence. Um, as I mentioned in the memo, that there's a nice coinciding with the holiday season. That's not the time to then start a public process. So we ex anticipate a January start for this kind of series of workshops and opportunities and constraints plan that includes very high level um, kind of cost comparisons um, for the public components, possible configurations and uses, and so that those things can be seen in context. And um, again, not promising exact costs, but more like order of magnitude comparisons so that people can understand what some of the implications would be if you do X versus Y. And then, you know, really taking that out into the community and really shopping that around and doing public workshops, identifying those um, those different areas of sensitivity, areas of um, opportunity, and really this part of the process, we some of which will be shaped by the public process itself, some of which will be shaped by what comes out of the due diligence. Um, if there's a we are, we haven't we're having an archaeological resources assessment done. If there's a lot of sensitive um, areas, that could very much impact what the vision might be. So um, we can't prescribe without making giant assumptions that none of us are wanting to do at this stage. 
So at that point, it will also potentially lead us to more research that is needed based on the public input and based on some ideas and workshopping. But we will be, again, taking that to various groups, um, having input received in various, in multiple ways. It may be that people want to submit feedback more verbally. Some people want to do a survey, so forth. And then really all that feedback being captured and relayed back. And I'm, I put this in the memo. I'm parking it here. It's not something we have to discuss tonight. But I think something for the council to be thinking about is how will the council make the decision to identify pathways forward for the for the planning team to pursue. Um, it's it's not up to the planning team to prioritize how the different scenarios are built. Um, we intend to hold hold all of that up and create the right process to hear everything and um, create and and view the consensus, um, but it'll be up to the council to have its own process for prioritizing the use and design direction within that public process. As was basically stated in the RFP, um, you know, it was expected that from this concept, these early concept ideas to concept plans for the master plan, um, there would need to be some direction. So I'm just putting that there. And then the last phase is, um, the last phase of the first phase is to prepare two or three scenarios of development pathways. And this is um, where we start to put some more precise or more um, clear costs and show the pros and cons more clearly and talk about what those next steps might be for each of the scenarios and then have more of those public sessions and opportunities for input that then get set back to the council and the council can then select the direction for the team to refine and then put into this actionable master plan. Now, this is light on the details because that's many, many sub phases until then. And we want to make sure that we're being responsive to the kind of um, direction we're being given by council, the feedback we're getting from the community and what attributes this, the site actually has, things we right now, I don't know about, you know, I don't know what I don't know yet, because we haven't done all of the natural resources inventorying and all of that. So this is the direction with more clarity to be filled in as we go through the process over the next several months. And that, um, I think is everything I had just to give you that overview. Again, we'll be at, um, uh, I'll just stop sharing this. Uh, we are going to be at the site on Saturday for the first of the live sessions, um, Saturday one to three, to do a walk and talk in uh, around the site, as well as um, doing a little bit of education and bringing everyone up to speed. I meant to mention that the input that we've gotten up to September is all, if it's not already on the website, it will be on the website in the next few days as a document so people can see what others have said over the last six months. And that will also be, we will also have that in paper form at the meeting on Saturday. Great. And it's supposed to be good weather. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, this is um, very helpful. And any questions for uh, Stephanie at this point? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. I uh, appreciate this this update and looking forward to getting into the process. Absolutely. Sounds great. Okay. See you thank guys you all so hopefully much. this weekend. Okay. Yes, hopefully. Okay. Take care. I'm going to be there being you. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, so I think we are. Oh, any any other comments about that? No. Okay. Public. Council. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so we are going to move on to the strategic plan. Um, and for this, I assume I'm going to turn things over to you, Bill. Sure. I was not, unless you would like to, I wasn't planning to go back into full discussion mode in the center or to go through it all. We basically took uh, your comments at the last meeting, got some feedback from staff, uh, and updated a, a draft strategic plan. Um, it, with edits and also uh, gave you the, the summary of the areas that were stalled. 
Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions about any of those. One issue that did come up, and I, I want to be sure to call it out, uh, we did get a request from a resident at the last meeting to include our odor control measures at the water resource recovery facility. We didn't put in the strategic plan, and the reason for that uh, is not because it's not important. It's because we're under order to do it, and it's a function that we are going to do and are already in the process of doing. Uh, it's it's um, we're certainly happy to include it if if the council would like that in there, but in the same way that we don't put in the strategic plan that we're going to plow roads in the winter, it's just something we're going to do. We we view you know we're mandated to do that. We we're getting the funds to do that, and we've got a plan, and we're we're doing it. But it, I, I want to emphasize that that's not that it's not important or that we're not intending it. But it's just not kind of a policy decision. But if uh, and I think. Uh, Linda's on, on the line, and I, I'm happy to answer that question. And uh, if the council just because you do wants it added, we'll be happy to okay. add it. Okay. Um, Jack, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, quick question I have, Bill, is do you know what the timeline for that is? I don't know exactly, but at our next meeting, we're, uh, Kurt will be here to actually do an update on, on that, the, the drying project in general, issues related to that. So it's a whole agenda item at the next meeting we're going over. So uh, I'd rather I'd rather he answer that question when he's prepared than me when I'm not. Yeah, fair enough. Um, any other thoughts from council? Uh, I I just wanted to clarify. So in the strategic uh, plan document, so there are parts that have been struck out um if it's if so if, some were struck out that were done like okay. the murray hill water system for example yeah and then we added in the barry main street intersection which we actually funded but mm -hmm. hadn't wasn't in that list mm -hmm. a couple were struck out uh, either because we had better wording mm -hmm. um there was one that we do have a question on, actually, I'm glad, and I'll get back to that. Um, <clears throat> and others that, you know, I think once we looked at these, I think the uh, we we are recommending that they be taken out either because we don't have the capacity to do them or for, for other, or in some got moved to other more appropriate places. Right. So uh, well, if you have specifics, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I was particularly to. looking at, uh, I guess it's, under improved community prosperity that's uh, sort of the yellow section um strategy yep. 1.4 it's the last part yep. of that section just just thinking about the expand slash formalize the peer support outreach worker um because i yeah, yeah so that's that, that. so so in general we had this whole strategy of sort of talking about what level the city social services could the city provide and i our recommendation is that we haven't really figured out a way to take that on um, we're, we're really kind of dealing it specifically on the homeless population the i think the uh, peer support outreach worker is in there somewhere else i believe we've, it's under um the public safety i'm gonna just double check. yes so if you go to ignition 6.11 it's there okay and i was very cognizant of the very good uh, comment that we got also at the last meeting that some of these were duplicative and mm -hmm. so to try to if, I, if things are showing up in multiple places to try to okay. make it easier to read gotcha okay yep no that makes sense um so the other one i did want to call out actually i'm glad you mentioned this is under the housing goal um we have uh, under 3.11 we have um, we talk about actively working with housing developers to accomplish successful housing projects um consider you know all this kind of and then we specifically called out support advancement of the christchurch affordable housing project now we have nothing against that project i think the question is at some point um we may be asked to support grant application for multiple projects so they could be competing projects so um and so the question would be are we calling this out as the highest priority one um, that we would sort of, because lacking any other direction from the council, that would be the way to interpret that from our perspective. So we have three groups that all want us to apply for a CDBG grant. We've got to pick one because you can only do one per round. This is one of them. 
absent any other guidance, I would say, well, this is the one that's been called out. So if that's great, that's great. If it's more, but you also just have work with housing developers to accomplish successful housing projects, which is more general. So I just wanted to raise that because we did put that in last year and it's a perfectly good goal to have, but I wanted to make sure we were thoughtful about whether we kept that or not um, because hopefully, you know, if we're doing our job well, we'll have all these people that want to do it and we'll, we'll have to choose from amongst others. Thoughts on that? And, you know, you don't, we can always amend this later too. So, but I wanted to call that out. I have thoughts on that, but my husband works for an affordable housing organization. So I'm going to not comment. Well, that's actually one that we were no, no. thinking of that could be. I feel like maybe I should just recuse myself. Maybe. For, yeah, because actually that was one that we thought we might be asked. I'm going to step out real quick while you talk about this. <laughs> Jack, you're up. Yeah. So, so the Habitat for, for Humanity was one. Christchurch, I mean, excuse me, Country Club Road site could be one. That, you know, it could be any number of other places, all good projects. No, no. And so are we we saying in writing that this is our highest priority housing project? And, and you know, one could argue it's in the center of downtown. It's been on the list the longest. There's good reasons why it could be, but that's not my call to make. Jennifer. Could somebody refresh my memory of what the Christchurch affordable housing project is? So Christchurch would like Christchurch in the center of town would like to expand. Um, right now they have a, a like a community center, and if someone here could explain it better, that would be great. But they have a community center, and they want to convert that to housing and expand it back toward the parking lot where Capitol Plaza's parking lot is. And they were actually actively working on that before we started the parking garage project. And we had to actually do a lot of uh, negotiating with them to figure out how to make them both work. And uh, the city has regularly expressed support for the idea that we would put affordable housing right in the center of town and they're interested in doing it. And we have, I think we may have even helped fund a feasibility study at some point in the past. So it's been an ongoing project. For any specific community or is it just for just low income housing? Yeah, it's qualified. It's not for us specific it's for qualified yeah it's not just for it's at their site but it wouldn't be just for Christchurch members it, it's for okay. down street would probably be the partner ah okay so um so but they're they're the ones that want to do it you know they like many churches they've got lower memberships so they're trying to figure out how to reuse their property in a way that's meaningful for the community and also reduces their costs and their their so I think um we're seeing a lot of our churches doing that now I was Kind of laughing when someone mentioned using the churches. I was like, they probably all get together and put their one church at the Elks Club and <laughs> just share costs. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that yes, that's what that project is. You're welcome. Anyone else have? Uh, uh, yes, Lauren. I mean, one thought having. I mean, it does seem like that specific project, like we had named it because it was like kind of ready to go and then got put on hold. And um, I mean, one, it's a wording tweak, but maybe just gives more flexibility of not feeling like you're locking into it would be, um, I mean, you've added in here, actively pursue creating housing at 203 Country Club Road, or we'll Country Club Road site, we'll <laughs> um, which I think is great to, to add in there to call that out. Um, what if we had actively work with housing developers to accomplish successful housing projects, such as the Christchurch Affordable Housing Project. Like to me, when I read housing developers, I think of like private developers. So I actually like giving an example of the kind of projects that we mean. Or we could that. say just support advancement of uh, affordable housing projects. Um, and you know, you're right. I, I do think. You know, if you talk to Downstreet, they talk about themselves as a housing developer, and um, and they and they have been probably the most prolific developer in our community over the last few years. I mean, the most successful. So, uh, but yes. Yeah, so when I, when I'm writing these things, that's who I'm thinking of. But you're right. I I think the the general perception of a developer is, you know, the the big deal from out of town with lots of money. <laughs> so quick to narrow it because some of the more successful housing develop 
our partnerships with private developers and employers. I mean, that's what's going on in Wyndham County, you know, 260 new units, but it's nine employers working with a nonprofit. So it's private dollars. So I'd rather leave it more broad. I think the real issue that got called out from our staff was, wasn't was so much the type of project. It was that this was a very specific project in a very specific location. And given yeah. other projects that we are aware of that will need grant funding, the, the potential could exist that we would have to make a decision, which normally would come to the council for you to choose. However, an argument could be made that if this was called out that that this is the top priority project. And again, I, I'm all, nothing against this project. We've been working actively with them and would love to see it happen. So with you, I think I would name it by itself. The only one I would name is the one we own the property right. on. Own the, the rest is general. Yeah. Okay. Carrie or Connor. Carrie. Yeah, this might be what Lauren already said. I'm not sure, but um something along the lines of support advancement of affordable housing projects such as the Christchurch project, for example. Is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah. Does anyone know um, where things stand with the uh, people at Christchurch and this project now? Um, only in general terms. Uh, they they are continuing to work with it. I think they are, at this point, they need a, a, an affordable housing partner, both, uh, I think, Housing Vermont and Downstreet have expressed interest, but, you know, they're stretched thin, and I think Downstreet has been pretty clear. They've done a number of projects in Montpelier in recent years, so they need to spread their work throughout the county, uh, but they are very interested, and so I think they are simply looking for someone to work with to to have this get this done, and they don't have that yet. So they're they're interested in pursuing it, but don't have the the engine yet. One thing that I want to be clear, I, I like the idea of saying support affordable housing projects, such as uh, the idea proposed by the uh, plan proposed by Christchurch or whatever language we use, but. I want to be absolutely clear if any of the Christchurch group are working here that this is in no sense stepping back from our support for for their efforts over the years because if they're there with a project that's ready to go I think we would support it and, and the I only agree. time this really becomes an issue it's it's not really an issue unless we have competing requests for grant applications and we have to prioritize. And you know, if I were if I were either in my seat or if I were in Christchurch seat, I would come and say, look, you 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 stated this. This was you this was a council priority, this was your strategic plan. You called us out by name. And I'd probably agree with them and, and come to the council and say, here's three projects. You've said this is the top priority. Um, you know, if there if if there's no competition in a given grant cycle, then this is a non-issue. But we are aware of um, multiple projects. Yeah. Cone of silence. So. Okay. Is everybody happy with making that change? You're not really happy, you gotta be can live with it. I just wouldn't name them. Like we know, I mean, I just wouldn't name them. That's all. But that's okay. Uh -huh. I'm not objecting. I just um and is there anyone in uh attending the meeting by Zoom that wants to be heard on this question? Peter. And your mute. Oh, there we go. Uh Jack, you're you're on the housing committee. Uh, I would think this would have been a question to ask the housing committee to weigh in on. We definitely can do that, and we don't. I don't think we need to make a decision on this tonight. Yeah, I mean, I, even if you approve the strategic plan tonight, that's you know there are something like that could be amended at a future meeting. This is your policy document. It's not an ordinance. It's not a. I think just to the extent that we are saying this piece is wrapped up, I, I want to make sure we call this out and had an intentional conversation, and later on it didn't come up and. Oh, we didn't really think about that. We didn't really talk about it. So 
And, you know, and I say that because that happened to me. It was, you know, called out by our, appropriately by our planning staff that said, hey, wait a minute, we're, we're working with all these people. Does this mean they're at the head of the class? And I said, good question. I don't know. So. Well, but now we've now we know that that's out there and we've got potentially altered language. And if the housing committee recommends something different, we can always change it. This isn't. This is one of the easier documents to amend in the course of a year. Josh isn't here, so we can't yep. ask him to put it on the agenda, but uh, we can ask. Uh, we, we have ways to get to Josh. We can ask, ask the chair to uh, put it on our agenda. Is that, are we good on that? Okay. All right, Thank come you. on back, Mayor. Um, to be fair, I I was uh, couldn't totally hear, so I'm not quite sure what we decided. We're we're talking about this again, maybe. Is that what I? Uh, so what we just we have some revise working to okay. support advancement of affordable housing projects like the Christchurch project, or such as the Christchurch project, okay. and then uh, the suggestion was made that this language we brought to the housing committee and so we're going to ask that it be done and if if they suggest an amendment we'll just amend it amend it at a future meeting but otherwise okay. we're good with this language okay. or the, the revised language for okay. okay super um uh, we all didn't have a a motion though y'all didn't vote on that but though. i assume it'll be when we vote on the final someone will Oh, I see. You don't want to. I don't want to be a part of that vote. Okay. So, so we I'll move to amend that. I'll second. You can probably just stand at the side of the room for the vote. Who moved? I thought I thought we heard Bill moving in. I, I said, "Who was someone?" Yeah. So he doesn't get to move it. I'll, I'll make the motion. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, the motion carries. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Oh, no, that's okay. Um. All right, so I think we... Uh, any other questions or thoughts or comments about the revised strategic plan? Uh, Connor, and then Don? You know, might have been in here and I missed it, but one, one thing we talked about a little bit, I, I'd like an explicit message to either the housing committee and to us uh, to look at uh, reducing evictions in town, either through a just cause, uh, ordinance charter change probably, uh, or some sort of rent stabilization policy. So I, I love just a line in there just because it's come up more recently, I think. Um, Sorry, I missed that. I, I I do remember you saying that, and I I think in my head I was thinking that was a legislative agenda. But you're right. Um, you didn't talk about that in here, so that would be in the housing section. Um, I think that's where it fits best, even though technically it's not creating more housing. But yeah, I, that's where I put it though, probably. Yeah. Maybe it's, yeah. Maybe statement about stabilizing existing housing, including rental, and then make a statement. That's right. Okay, well, I'll find a right place. Uh, if you, you just uh, will, if you if you give us license and just add that in, we'll put that in. So, so, you know, the, that so we have a motion to approve reduce evictions through legal means available. Um, Donna the Jack, sorry. Yeah. Okay, Jack, go ahead. It it could also conceivably go in the homelessness section, reduce or prevent homelessness by. Uh, Reducing eviction, something like that. Yeah, so, it stuck it under the meet emergency housing needs section. So, um, Peter, is that on this topic? Yeah, go, I'm gonna. Is that okay? Okay, so I'm gonna go to Peter Kelman, and then we'll go to Donna. Uh, again, uh, why not ask the housing committee to weigh in on the housing recommendations in the strategic plan? Why not ask the homeless? This task force to weigh in on some of these things. 
you've got committees like those, and, I'm sure, I'm, and these are probably not the only ones. If the, the transportation committee, are, are, have you asked them to weigh in on these? I'll just answer. Uh, the, 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 in my mind, that would be a way of saying, okay, this is a priority. Please come, come with some ideas to us, because I think they do need to be the ones who flesh it out. Sorry, I was a little distracted. So... Nice reverb. <laughs> so we are going to go ask them. Is that what you're saying? No. Yeah, I, I think by stating it explicitly in the strategic plan, it would be a message to the Housing Committee, Homelessness Task Force, maybe, whoever wants to like come to the table with ideas, maybe just cause eviction ordinance or charter change isn't the best way to go, you know. Right. But, but we got to get a handle on this and we got to get it soon, I think. No, I, I'm hoping that the housing task force housing committee will um have some thoughts suggestions yeah, around all of that so yeah uh donna yeah just sort of wanted to bring it back that we've had this discussion on this council strategic plan this is our third meeting and maybe more we've talked about this well, second Archie, this year and then uh, yeah. last year. So, I mean, I feel like we are in touch with committees. And so I, I, you know, would hope as we move along, if things come up within the committees, all of us attend, that we would then go back and say, oh, this came up on this point and we would change it. So I don't feel we have to, to wait to go to any committee right now and get their words on it, that many of us have already talked to people in groups and, and have general consensus and any additions we get will integrate in. It's perfectly appropriate for the city council as the governing body, the city to say this is a priority. We're referring it to this committee to flesh out sure. what we'd like done. I guess that's what I was sort of talking about. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. Other thoughts or suggestions? Uh, and we just want to check in with folks with us online. Any other thoughts or suggestions? Okay. All right. Uh, is there a motion regarding the updated strategic plan? So, so moved. So move the, move the, um, the strategic plan with the amendments adopted. The evening. And a couple. there is, yes. <laughs> the, so with okay. the with Connor's yes, eviction. So right. Second. Back in. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Further discussion? Um, okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, and opposed. All right, so. That's very helpful. I mean, I, I you know, we, staff really appreciates you doing that, and I know we can then tell the public this year, this is what we're doing, and then next year we can look forward to uh more robust process and here comes a member Brown's stored up ideas. I'm just okay. So we are at the end of our regular business. So we're gonna jump to council reports. Uh because I have no creativity. Donna, you get to go first. Well, I That's got to go to Burlington uh yesterday to see the initial put up of the pilots of the shelters. And they it's really amazing. They had a team of like six people who just two at a time carry different pieces, stack it together like it was big Legos, and put it together. I was just so amazed. There was one gentleman who actually could put the roof panels on without a ladder, or even, and another one only used a short footstool. I mean, it was very slick, very well done. I took a bunch of pictures. Of the shelters they're putting up are the more insulated ones. They're single. They're much more roomy inside. I've lived in rooms smaller um so it was really good and unfortunately the community room and the, the toilets etc aren't going to come in until november and one of their biggest issues is um you know in your fuse not fuse box what do you call it it's the old time circuits they don't they can't they can't find enough circuits to to start it so they're way late until next year it's just amazing uh, things that we can't get supplies on. 
But anyway, it was just wonderful. Everybody was very friendly and helpful. And um, Ben was there from the company itself, who uh, I and Bill had a remote meeting with in February. And so it was really good. Was, I'm really glad I went. And the other thing was the Vermont League City and Towns. Uh, their town fair was wonderful. And I just have to commend Bill and the other city managers, city uh, select board members, and just general people who go to these meetings. The administrative meeting went from one to five, and people were focused. And these are rules and, and efforts to reduce our cost and to make sure that we have the right insurance for our municipals. I was just so impressed with the whole group, Bill. It was uh, every year, but it was just very much even more so this year. Uh, it was very well, well, well done. Council got the bill of the city manager and Barry for the whole dinner. And the mayor of Burlington, right? <laughs> Okay. I'll pass it okay, Jennifer. Okay, Jack. I'm glad to see that the uh, Department of Public Works has finished up uh, the paving job on Main Street. You know, the first uh, first round of work was done uh, right around the beginning of school year, and just the last couple of days, they seem to have the entire uh, second coat on uh, all the way from <clears throat> from the bottom up to uh, just below uh, Town Hill Road where the work was needed to be done. It is great to drive on. Um, I will also remind the uh, members of uh, of the city council that as members of the board of abatement we have uh, a board of abatement meeting uh, tomorrow at uh, i think it's 5 15 and it is uh, it should be a, a pretty quick meeting but uh, we should all try to be there so so that we have a quorum because last time we didn't yeah yes you can all attend remotely Okay, um, I just want to recognize that this past Monday, uh, Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, hosted a, a basically a congratulatory uh, thank you event for Senator Patrick Leahy for his service. Uh, he's done a lot for downtowns uh, in Vermont as well as um, he's done. A, he's just done a lot for Vermont. Um, I learned things about. Um, the senator that I, I didn't know before um, apparently was uh, very instrumental in getting a nationwide uh, bulletproof vest program, which has saved thousands of lives. Uh, so there, that's just one example, that, but there were um, many other things that uh, were just really remarkable. And so I had the honor of speaking at that event since Patrick, Senator Leahy, uh, his hometown is Montpelier, so um, I was delighted and honored to be able to speak uh, at that event. Um, and then just want to remind folks uh, the tour of the Country Club Road site is this Saturday, 1 p.m. Uh, on location. So um, if you're able to make it out to that, that will, I think it should be a, a good opportunity check out the land and see the uh, what opportunities may be there. So uh, that is it for me. Um, John. Hey, uh, I should just mention that the um, election is going, it's very busy in my office right now. <laughs> We've got a lot of volunteers coming in that make it work, which is great. Um, I would also mention that I don't know, I think most of you all know that uh, uh, Crystal is no longer the deputy city clerk. She's moved across the hall to work for finance. And uh, I have offered uh, the job to someone and they have accepted, but uh, she won't be on board until later in November. But if you are curious, it is Sarah McMillan. And she is currently, what is she currently? She's currently the... Um, 
city clerk in, oh shoot, I cannot remember for the life of me. Ah, in Duval, Washington. Um, and she has been a city clerk and or treasurer for about five other towns in the Washington and Idaho area. She's a certified municipal clerk uh, like I am through the International Clerks Association. She's got a ton of skills. She wanted to move to Vermont, um, so she's on her way. Um, anybody knows of a, of a nice apartment in town, let me know. I'll pass it on. Uh, but anyways, I expect to learn at least as much from her as she's going to learn from me. Um, and I'm pretty excited. We're going to have the, the real power team at the clerk's office, I think. Yeah, very cool. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. Wow. Great. Uh, Bill. Yeah, I actually have a few things, uh, if you'll bear with me. Um, let's see, which way do I want to start? Oh, okay, well, I'll go with the easy ones first. One quick question. The Montpelier Housing Task Force applications that we postponed, uh, the question is pretty simple. The question is, would you prefer that people fill out the full form or is just an email indication? One of the reasons we only got email is because there was some confusion, I think, last week about whether they needed to apply and so actually the reason why we asked to have it delayed so uh i've got a couple questions saying well if you delay it do we have to fill out the full thing or just is our email okay and i said you know that i'm not the appointing authority so i will ask so any quick thoughts okay so when someone applies for a uh, committee appointment we have a form that you you go online and you fill out form and that's what you all usually see some of the existing members have simply sent an email saying i wish to be reappointed and some of that was because of the time they some of them won't think they well and i don't want to get it some people felt they only only really became aware of this like last thursday or friday at least they thought that was the case and so it's just sending the quick email to make sure they got their name in thinking that it was for tonight so the question is now that we're extending it for a couple of weeks do we want them to fill out the full form? I mean, I think that's reasonable, but I just wanted to have a clear answer. Sure. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Thank you. That's one. Um, Councilmember McCullough mentioned the Main Street paving up to Town Hill, just for people that are in that area. There is also uh, construction work on a culvert. You just approved the road closure under the consent agenda tonight. Is it appearing in next Tuesday, the 18th, that road will be closed um, to traffic, which will create huge um, detour situation because a lot of through traffic comes through there in both directions, particularly in the mornings. So for those of us that live in that neighborhood and others that are normally come downhill to Main Street on Tuesday, the 18th, seek alternate route. Uh, and when that project is done, that road will then be paved up to do. Um, because it's in such bad shape. So rather than just doing this project area, we're going to do so, so a lot of a lot of advancements in paving been done this year. So we've heard a lot about bad road conditions and I, hats off to DPW. There's really been a lot of work done. If you've noticed College, Berry Street, uh, over on Wheelock and uh, Phelps, there's uh, also going to be getting finished paving pretty soon. So. Will Evelyn or someone be putting together like a graphic about like, hey, for this day, heads up? Okay, great. So we can circulate that. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. But just mentioning it now in case you hear about it. Um, Donna mentioned VLCT Town Fair, and we do. they did adopt the municipal policies, all of them, uh, without change. Um, but I also wanted to mention, because it's come up here um, a couple times, and I wanted to make sure the council was aware, we, we as staff were very excited to learn, they have now created a new local funding assistance program. So they had one person on board that was simply doing ARPA funding. But now with all these federal monies, they actually brought a second person. And they have two. In fact, it was Bonnie Wanninger from our, had been the head of the Regional Planning Commission. So she and Katie Buckley now, some of you may know Katie, who's worked in administration positions. The two of them are specifically funded to assist all municipalities with finding out what grants are available, what funding, what projects, what they need, and help us apply for them. So 
given their proximity to us, we expect to be spending quality time with them for our various projects. So that resource is uh, obviously not just for Montpelier, but it does exist and it's available to us. So that's great. On to more important things, council photo. We need a time for council to, you know, I was hoping we could do it Saturday, but some of you won't be able to make it. So there's always the come early, we take the picture in this room. That's a hardy perennial. We try to get outside sometimes when we can. Last year, as you recall, we did it at the Mayor's Baby Shower uh, <laughs> uh, because we happened to be standing outside and Cameron's husband took the picture. Uh, <laughs> but you just never know. So I don't know if people, if you would like us to send something out. Sometimes, you know, finding the dates is the hardest part. So the council meeting dates are the best things. So uh, if anyone has an idea of a location, I mean, in some ways, I think the Country Club site is such a, we're certainly going to put it on the front page of the, on the front of the annual report this year, but. Okay, well, if. It's tonight out. Yeah, I think it should be 6.30, 5.30, something like that. Well, like end, of, end of October. Yeah, it'll still be before daylight savings, but. Yeah, be getting, before daylight savings, it'll help. So. Oh, I wish it was. I don't think so. There was a talk about it, but I don't think it actually happened. Okay, so, moving on. So we will we will aim perhaps for the, the next meeting, maybe a 5.30 meeting at, out there, and we'll get pictures. Does that work? 5.30 on the 20? Well, our meeting's at 6. I, I'm thinking of the light. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's already past, you know. I'll just bring some dinner. Okay. Well, okay. Yeah, there we go. That's we shouldn't take we or we could do it even earlier take the picture then you have an hour, more time we could do it at five take the picture and then you have an hour and a half before the meeting or we can do it here at 6 15 in, in this room so what's that don't do it here we can do it in the stairwell we could do it outside 5 30 of what's that what clock tower, Wait, clock tower? Somewhere there exists a picture of me up, way up. I had a newspaper article many, many years ago up from that the very top of the clock tower. Okay, so so now on to more substantive things, um, stuff that came up during the meeting today. Uh, first of all, the river cleanup was mentioned and is correct. It hasn't happened yet. It's actually been scheduled for four consecutive Fridays, and because of rain conditions and water height, um, it wasn't safe to do it. So it is technically, it is scheduled for this Friday, um, but we are also expecting heavy rain tomorrow. So if it is safe to put people in there and do the work, we will do it. It is correct. That hasn't been done, but it's not for lack of scheduling and trying and coordinating. It's been a safety issue. So that's on the way. Also mentioned uh, the can situation. Um, did meet um, Mr. Kelman is correct that uh, that there has been staffing changes, and I do think it's an open question whether Sustainable Montpelier Coalition can uh, meet its terms of its contract. We met with them um, yesterday to talk about it and to hear what their thoughts are. I, I don't want to get into too much detail. I would say that, that their ideas do stretch beyond more than just Vermont College of Fine Arts, um, but we're evaluating we staff will make a recommendation to you how we think we should go um certainly no question it's a valuable resource i do think one of the things that struck me however is that out of what they've identified about 45 43 neighborhood groups 15 of them have coordinators and the rest don't so it's fun it works well in the neighborhoods that have coordinators it does you know the others aren't getting served so we have to think about it as we're trying to get the word out it's great that we can get the word out in those neighbors, but then other people aren't. So one of the things that they were supposed to be doing was developing those networks in all the neighborhoods and that they were pretty clear they can't do that. You know, we now have Evelyn on which we've got to evaluate whether there's um, a better way to deliver the service and still keep their neighborhood connection. So that is clearly something that will be coming to you. Lastly, there was a reference made to a public earlier this meeting to a public records request that was being neglected. And I just wanted to uh, provide a little bit more background on that. The request was for all records dating back to Chief Pete's uh, hiring that are, that referred to his integrity. I believe the word correct words were used is integrity or professionalism. And so I asked if they were 
records that I had received or anybody. At first, it was me, and I told the requester that the only records I had received that called that into question were from the requester, and that therefore he had them all already, that I had not received any from anybody else. He then asked for any such request to any city official in our system. Um, so I ran, we ran a search, and it turned up, so what do you search for, right? In professionalism, whatever it was, integrity, honesty, veracity. So it doesn't include things like lying or anything like that. And Brian P. And we got 64,000 records. So I informed the individual that we would be happy to, um, if he was willing to pay the fee for beyond a half an hour to sort through 64,000 records, um, that we would do so or he could narrow it down. Uh, and he has declined to indicate either of his preferences and has instead inferred that um, because I don't have them in a file that I'm not doing my job. And as I told him, the, the, the requests we have received that I've received all came from him. So he has them all. Um, so I am aware of those. Has the chief received them that I don't know about? I don't know. Have any of you? I don't know. Um, and so that's where that is. So it has not really been neglected. He is right that at one point I did tell him, oh, sorry, I forgot about it. Because what I had told him was I would try to scan through and see if it was easy to pick through the 64,000 to try to save him the hassle. And I did tell him that I forgot to do that and I would try. And then, you know, that was unacceptable. So I reiterated, would you rather pay the fee or narrow the request? And that's where it stands. So just for you and anyone who's watching, um, all of the records requests are taken seriously. Um, and so from where I sit, that's the process that has yeah, th thank you for that update. I appreciate it. Um, so having recently been through the public records request in my my day job as a state employee a, a couple of different times, I'm I'm learning a lot about how it works. But one of the things that I've um, is true at the state level is that there's a database and a record that's online of all of the public records requests that come in. And so anybody from the public can go and see what they are. And I don't want to add work to city staff's plates, but I but I just want to kind of put out the idea that I think it would be pretty informative and and educational for the community as a whole if um if we had such a such a record of that so that because I don't I don't think that people understand just how much time is being spent um, how much of staff time is being spent, even when you don't end up turning over the records, the time that it took you to identify those 64,000 and all of the, you know, the time processing it, it's quite significant. Um, and so I just think it might be a good transparency of government kind of thing to think about if you can think of doing it in a way that doesn't add a lot to your So thank workload. you. And we have thought about that and we still may do that. I would say that the vast majority of our public records requests, really the overwhelming majority are, I'd like a, you know, the the accident report from the police department or, I'm, you know, I've someone's got a tenant, can you give me all, you know, I've got a problem with a tenant, can you give me all police calls that relating to this individual or the other way around, I've got a problem with my landlord, you know, and they're, we turn them around in a day. And they're, they're pretty straightforward, they're what, you know, somebody would expect and, um, and then really, um, so that we, the, most of the large ones come from one person. We do have a very large one coming from VT Digger right now that uh, wants, I think, back for five years, every email, anything having to do with a water break or sewer line break or any discussion at all of water pressures. Seems like overkill, but again, it was tens of thousands of records and actually Shannon who was our temporary person Mary's back by the way we've retained Shannon because and she's all she's doing is sorting through those emails um, to try to figure out the response and we've told them we're going to charge them because it's so voluminous and you know again they were not willing to sort of pare it down um, so fine they'll get what they answer but that is very rare um, from most even news agencies or um Really, the, the the ones like I just described really all come from the same person. Every, but everything else is um, 
pretty manageable. I mean, they're, there's a lot of them, but they're what you would expect and reasonable. And if some, usually if somebody needs something bigger, they're very apologetic and like, well, take your time, that kind of thing. It's uh, so we actually, yeah. Don't want to discourage people from asking for public records if they because they're entitled to them. Just didn't we have a uh, address or something that if public records requests were happening, they were funneled into? Yeah. So there should be a, a record. We do have. One. We um, could do that. I mean, we could do that. Yeah. I, I think the other simple question. I mean, so part of obviously, if somebody made a public request for all of the public mm -hmm. requests, we would provide them. One of one of their. I think the the flip side of that, and I'm all for public transparency, but you know, if somebody's seeking uh, information on a ex spouse or a land, you know, th there's some privacy. Like, you know, they're doing they didn't maybe didn't expect to be in a list of on the city's website of this was information asked for. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, if if that is important, we certainly can do it. We've sort of said, hey. 99% of these people are doing what you would expect and playing by the rules and take, you know, doing nothing out of the ordinary. And, you know, I think if anything, maybe at some point I could provide a, a report on the, the heavier users and how frequently that's occurred and the types of requests they've asked and uh, that could become public, but um so anyway, I just wanted to address because one one particular request was brought up, and um, there were partial accuracy in that, but not mm -hmm. complete. So that's all I have. Okay, I uh, know. Yeah. Even no matter how many different ones or same ones, I think it would be helpful information to have in perspective, and particularly like even with the league within their legislative agenda, there were two amendments they wanted to the open meeting law. And one was about, you know, requesting records repeatedly within a calendar year. So I would think it would be helpful if towns kept records, just minimally, at least of what's coming in or how many, for information to the legislators of how the open meeting law is or isn't, record request is or isn't functioning, that's all. Not to make it onerous, but um, Jack. Well, I'm curious as you talk about what record re requests come in, has there been uh, anything? Have you seen any significant number of uh, body cam video requests now that the police have uh, cameras? No, only from one individual. Thanks. Um, also, I uh, just want to know, I probably should have said this along with my um, update, but I just want to recognize that uh, this evening, um, the professionalism of the uh, police was attacked. The, your professionalism as a city manager was attacked. And I just want to let both the police department and you know that I think uh, the police department's doing a great job and you're doing a great job. And I'm very grateful for all of the work that um, that you do, that the police department does. Um, and uh yeah, so just because it came up, I wanted to make sure it was addressed. Thank you. And, and I know so are you, Mayor. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, and I, I know the city staff in general appreciates the support of the city council and feels that um, you're respectful of them. I, you know, I, Kelly and I had this experience uh, at, at the ICMA conference you know, a couple weeks ago, listen, talking to our peers and hearing them talk about their city councils. And people would say, well, how's your city council? And I, you know, I said, and I'm not, I said it there, she heard me, I said, it's how you would want a city council to be. You know, they don't always agree, they don't always agree with us, but they disagree respectfully, they ask questions, they're respectful of staff, defensive of staff, they're interested in working in the best interest of the community. If they have a split vote, they just move on, there's no lingering resentment. And I said, it's as high functioning as you could possibly hope for and as respectful. I said, I'm just, you know, <laughs> knock on wood. So, just so... With that, I mean, don't vote for any of them to go to other offices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Well, and on that note. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Oh gosh. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, we are done. No, no other comments, right? We're we're good. Okay. So um, with that, uh, we will consider um, the meeting uh, without objection. Excuse me. We'll consider the meeting adjourned. Nine twenty-seven. Thanks, everybody. Yep.